good morning, everyone. Oh, we're almost there. Let's try one more time. Let's pretend we had our coffee this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, and welcome to today's Wrongful Conviction Summit. My name is Jacqueline Pena. I'm your Dean of Faculty, and I'm here on behalf of our president, Dr. Melusi Harrison, and our campus leadership. They couldn't be here today. Everyone is at the Wilson campus, but they wanted to share their thank yous and their warm welcomes for today's event. Um, I also know we have a lot of special thank, um, guests. I'm sorry, and I want to give thanks to a few of our guests. First, we have our high schools. We have Barbara Goldman Senior High School. Is that correct? Yes. Are they really here? Yes. I can't hear you. No. Oh. <laughs> And I believe we have Matter Lakes uh, Law Academy. Uh, <laughs> and I believe we have our Miami Dade College students. <laughs> and we also have a few other special guests. We have our law enforcement officials here today. Thank you for joining us. Our faculty, our support staff as well. Oh, and we also have all of our panel speakers today who took time out of their busy schedules to come to you today with information and conversations that are critical and are becoming more and more critical as you see more and more of these wrongful conviction cases coming to light. And as you see the power that you have out there in helping overturn some of these convictions and bring information to light. So I hope that today you have a wonderful day that you really enjoy the speakers, learn and ask questions. Do you promise to do that for me? Yes. I'm not feeling it. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> okay, and, and we're here for you today. Our doors are always open. This is one of many, many wonderful activities that our School of Justice faculty bring to us every year. So keep your ears and eyes open for other opportunities to learn more about these critical topics. And with that, I'm going to pass the microphone over to uh, Vincent Como, who's going to give you a welcome as well. Thank you, Dean Pena. My name is Vincent Como, and I have the pleasure of serving as the department chair for the School of Justice here at the North Campus. And it is my pleasure to read to you a message from our dean, of Public Safety, Fire Science and Law Studies, Dr. Raimundo Socorro, who could not be here. So I read his letter. I would like to thank the panel members for taking time out of their already busy schedule to be with you today. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for understanding the importance of this discussion and the faculty for putting it together. Specifically, Professor Samantha Carlo, Professor Sharon Plotkin, assisted by Professor Selena Respas. I am truly sorry I could not attend. In the last 20 years, the media have reported numerous cases in which people have been wrongfully convicted of rape and murder, years earlier were exonerated and released from prison. Many of these exonerations occurred after post-conviction DNA testing established their innocence. In some of these cases, DNA evidence established the innocence of multiple defendants who had been wrongfully prosecuted, convicted, and incarcerated. In other cases, innocent individuals were released from prison after serving many years on death row. To date, post-conviction DNA testing has exonerated more than 230 prisoners. 2016 set yet another record for exonerations in the United States. 166 that we know of so far in 25 states the District of Puerto of Columbia, federal courts, and Puerto Rico. This record continues a trend as the rate of exonerations has been increasing rapidly for several years. The problem of wrongful conviction transcends race. There have been 180 African Americans, 82 Caucasians, 21 Latinos, two Asian Americans, and four of unknown race who were proven innocent by DNA testing. The reasons for wrongful convictions vary from eyewitness misidentification to government misconduct. Whatever the reason, one person wrongfully convicted of a crime is too many. 
We must make certain that no one is punished for crime they have not committed. That is why these discussions are so important. Our hope today is that you gain an understanding of why wrongful convictions occur, how they can be eliminated, and finally, that you leave here with the knowledge that you have the power to drive criminal justice reform. Thank you. And next, I would like to introduce our next, next speaker, but this is the point where I need my notes and I left them really far away. Does this ever happen to you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so our next speaker is here from the Florida Division for the International Association of Identification. And I wanted to be able to do this special welcome and thank you. It is one of the oldest organizations, started in 1915, it's one of the largest organizations, I understand, um, and also they're a wonderful supporter of today's events. So I wanted to be able to thank you personally here before you come and take the mic. Thank you for supporting us for this very important conversation today. Thank you, Cameron. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is some speeches to follow up, so mine's gonna be pretty short. Um, my name is Cameron Stauffer. I'm a latent fingerprint examiner with Miami Day PD. And I'm also the Region 5 Director of the FDII. So I oversee Miami-Dade County, Broward County, and the Keys. So we have the largest population in the state of Florida and the largest uh, attendees and the largest members in our region. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, again, we're here to help co-host this event. Uh, I have certificates for those that RSVP. For those that didn't, you'll get one eventually. And um, I hope you guys have a great day. And again, if you have questions, these are some of the best people to ask questions to, especially the younger ones here that are trying to get into this field. It's a very good opportunity to hear from people with some well respect. So thank you again, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. So good morning, I am Sharon Plotkin. I am one of the faculty that uh, organized this event today. And I remember when I got hired four years ago by President Harrison, she said, well, what are you gonna do for the students? And I said, I'm gonna bring in 20 years of resources. And that's what I did today. So I thank personally the panelists that have come today. Uh, one, we begged, we pulled in old favors and asked friendships to come to play so that we could educate you, um, the public, the students, and those that are in law enforcement as well as those that aspire to be. So with that, I just wanted to give you some uh, housekeeping real quick. The coffee station is over there. This event runs until about one o'clock. If you need to take a break, we will have a couple organized breaks today for you, but uh, the bathrooms are, the men are over here, the women is over here as well. Um, and um, hopefully we have the parking situation under control so nobody should be towed today as well. There will be tables set up uh, after from 11.30 to 1.30 where we're gonna do book signing as well as selling books pertaining to the topic and that'll be set up outside in the lobby. Um, and on the first floor we have a cafeteria, a cafe, excuse me. So if you are hungry you can go and purchase uh, food downstairs on the first floor. So with that, I'd like to introduce our very first panelist, Lori St. John, is the founder and director of the former Innocence Project at Rutgers School of Law. She served as the Assistant Deputy Public Defender in the Adult Felony Division of the Essex County Public Defender's Office in New Jersey. She also served on the Committee for Colorado Innocence Project and litigated criminal and post-conviction cases through the Alternate Defense Council. She's a licensed attorney in New York, New Jersey, and Colorado. She's also a CPA in Florida, where she was the Chief Compliance Officer, which is a city auditor for the city of Coral Gables. As a speaker for numerous organizations, she's been called upon to educate others on the subject of wrongful convictions, ethics in law, and interviewing techniques. She's the author of Corruption of Innocence, which she will be doing, she'll be selling her books and signing outside. Um, which is a journey for justice, which was a true story of a four-year journey to save an innocent man who was on death row, through which her efforts grew into an international campaign, including the support of Pope John Paul II and Mother Teresa. She was the convening speaker at the 50th anniversary on the Declaration of Human Rights in Florence, Italy, where she and former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark represented the United States on the subject of the death penalty. 
through her off though her office through her office in Colorado, she's often called upon to consult on possible cases of wrongful convictions in the appellate process. Welcome, Lori St. John. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I always love speaking to young people. I miss teaching at the Rutgers School of Law, and so thank you all for coming out. Um, my journey started about 24 years ago, and I have to say, in sharing my story with you, it was precipitated or actually resulted in a 24-year journey of me studying wrongful convictions. That being said, I was privileged to be able to start the second Innocence Project in our country. At that time, there was only one Innocence Project in New York, ran by Barry Shack. Um, I started the Innocence Project actually as a law student and ran it after I left for some number of years uh, while I litigated in New Jersey. Uh, I'm going to start right away getting into it because we, I, I, my time is limited and I have so much to say, but I am the author of The Corruption of Innocence. I authored this book many, many years after I worked a case for about four years, and I did so because Barry Sheck and I had a conversation many years ago. <clears throat> He actually thought the number of ex exonerations would diminish in number over the period of time. But instead of uh, diminishing in number with the, inner, the social media that we have nowadays, we kept seeing more and more wrongful convictions than ever before. And I felt like I had like a, this dirty little secret inside and I ne really needed to share this backstory of what happens behind closed doors. And I'm not saying, let me preface this by saying that I don't believe that there's, there's bad everywhere at all. For the most part, I think people in the criminal justice system really strive to do the right thing. But occasionally, like in every profession, you're gonna find unintentional and intentional misconduct, and that leads to what you're, what you're seeing today. So let me start my story with you. <clears throat> I was looking for something to do back in 1993. I was uh, married to an orthopedic surgeon. And my father was an assistant attorney general. And I pretty much thought I, I might have had everything in life that I wanted. But something was missing. And I wanted to give back to the world in a very big way. And I just didn't really know what that way was. I decided to close my CPA practice in Princeton, New Jersey, and I was sitting there having a cup of tea, and I saw an article in front of me about wrongly convicted people. And I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, there are wrongly convicted people in this world? How could that possibly be? But keep in mind, this is 1993, and we didn't have everything all over the internet. Well, I saw the article and I thought they couldn't turn me down if I volunteered my time. So I walked into the office of Centurion Ministries in Princeton, New Jersey, and I volunteered my time. And lo and behold, they gave me cases, case after case after case, until they gave me the case of Joseph Roger O'Dell. I knew nothing about crime. I knew nothing about prison. I was pretty sheltered in my life. And so this was all brand new to me, but I was open to everything. And so... In getting this case, I started reading all about Joseph O'Dell. <clears throat> um, let me share a in the beginning. Um, before I get there, I, uh, just a brief thing about the, um, the city of Coral Gables. I was fortunate enough to be the, the, the auditor in the city. Um, that led me to look at the, an audit, the property and evidence room, um, to meet with Kalia Standards. I have to say that, that it was an amazing opportunity to see the other side of things as a defense attorney, and it was pretty an, uh, an amazing opportunity to see how well run the property and evidence room was in that particular place. So let me move on <clears throat> with the story. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> He said that he was innocent. That's what they all say. Joseph Roger O'Dell, born September 20th, 1941, charged with a capital murder, rape and sodomy of a Virginia Beach secretary. Arrested on February 8th, 1985, sentenced to die on November 11th, 1986. A death row inmate, I was assigned his case. I had seen his name on the board as a potentially innocent man wrongly accused and facing death. 
<clears throat> it was on February 6, 1985 at 8.30 p.m. on a cold, rainy night when Helen Shartner met up with friends and a cousin at a country western bar, Country Line Inn in Virginia Beach. It was ladies' night. Helen sat at a table with four women and her daughter, Jennifer Hunt. They drank and danced until approximately 11.15 p.m. when Helen's boyfriend, Ike Wright, walked through the door. He slow danced with Helen, and after a brief bathroom visit, he returned, only, um, returned to find his arms in a similar embrace around another woman. Visibly upset, Helen left at approximately 11.25 p.m. and no later than 11.30 p.m., she was carrying a black umbrella, her car keys, and pocketbook. Joseph O'Dell was at the same bar that night. He was seen by the victim's cousin on the other side of the nightclub. It was established there was no contact between Joe and the victim that night or any other time, nor did they know one another. Testimony at trial from an employee revealed that Joe O'Dell was still at the bar at midnight. When questioned how he remembered the time, he replied, that's when he stopped collecting the cover charge. I was counting the money when I looked up and saw Joe O'Dell by the bathroom area. Unchallenged by the defense was the prosecution's claim that Joe waited outside for the victim. As she approached her car, he slid a gun to her side, forcing her into his car where he began a violent sexual assault, strangling her before dumping her body in a muddy field across the street, behind the, after, um, the parking lot of the After Midnight Club. She was found the next day by a passerby who never testified at trial. She had been beaten in the head, her clothes soaked with blood. <clears throat> a prosecution claimed Odell then went across town, showed up in the parking lot of another bar covered with the victim's blood, and walked into a 7-Eleven convenience store before returning to his girlfriend Connie's house. Having no explanation for Odell's lack of concern, having just committed a murder and showing up in a public parking lot of a bar he is known to frequent, the prosecution claimed he was high from the murder. My job was to find out the truth. Was Joseph O'Dell a rapist and murderer, or was he facing the death penalty for a crime he knew nothing about? Either way, strangely enough, I have no fear of him. I knew nothing, like I said, about crime. This is Joe O'Dell. <clears throat> a picture that actually was unknown and circulated around the world where millions of people would eventually know him. But for the time being, Joe O'Dell was just a death row con. At the beginning, I, I needed to learn everything I needed to know about this case. And that meant if I was going to do an investigation, I had to study hard. I contacted Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison in New York, uh, the pro bono lawyers, and I got 31 volumes of transcripts. In these 31 volumes of transcripts, it literally took me six months to read and summarize the transcripts. I was looking for the location of the witnesses. I was looking at the correlation and the relationships between all the parties, addresses, whatever I could do to make my investigation what it needed to be. And so I studied it for, for six months and I started making a summary of absolutely everything in those transcripts. And it wasn't only the transcripts, it was pre-trial motions, post-trial motions, psych reports. I mean, I had everything in my fingertips that I needed to study this possible case of wrongful convictions. Um, this also included a numerous array of Commonwealth exhibits, all of the evidence that, that was presented at trial, the clothing from the defendant, um, everything that, that, that possibly could be used against uh, Joseph Roger O'Dell. Um, he was convicted in 1985, and at that time they didn't have DNA testing. Um, he, at, before I came involved, um, he had actually petitioned Alec Jeffries, who was the founder of DNA testing in 1988. He petitioned the trial court to get access to DNA testing because he figured, wow, if this new thing could actually prove someone's guilt, maybe it could prove someone innocent. And he had the foresight to want to do DNA testing. Um, he actually got that um, granted in 1990, and those tests came back, and it's really important to try to pay attention to the details because this is before DNA testing was really big. Um, those, those results came back, and they came back in a, in a, a variety of ways. Um, <clears throat> the DNA testing on his shirt, <clears throat> this is a, a, sero a test of the serology testing that was done. The shirt and the, and the jacket <clears throat> that was tested 
only uh, had 10 enzymes that they tested. When they tested it for DNA testing, even though during trial they said all of the evidence was the, the uh, blood evidence of the victim's um, blood on his clothing, Joe O'Dell always claimed that yes, he was across town, but he was in a fight, and that's where he got the blood on his clothing. Well, the DNA test came back, um, lo and behold, that this that very same area that they tested in serology testing actually showed a DNA exclusion. The area that they tested on the jacket, at the time, Life Codes used a DXYS14 probe, and it aligned uh, the bands for a three-probe match, and that actually was thrown out of court. Nowadays, we would call it junk science. Um, back then, it was litigated. The FBI didn't use that method. Uh, two cases showed that it was thrown out of court, and it wasn't used. So the only viable results was that the DNA testing showed that the victim's blood was not exactly what they said it was. It was not the, the blood that was on Odell's clothing. Um, the crime scene evidence could be summarized as I read the transcript as a, of, of a number of things. Obviously, the biggest thing was the blood evidence, and uh, like I said, they did serology testing. Um, there was a cigarette butt that was found at the scene. There were soil samples that were taken. There was a footprint casting, a jailhouse snitch, and another person of interest who found the body. Keep in mind that in, when you see this chart, there are only two items of clothing that have um, results right up on top of 10 enzymes tested. All of the other ones had one, two, five, six, but yet the word was used, used throughout the trial was consistent with, um, consistent with the victim, consistent with the victim. So my job was to investigate, and the first thing I did was call Richard Reyna. Richard Reyna um, investigated the Timothy McVeigh case, and he's done many exonerations throughout the country. He's one of the best that there is. Richard uh, uh, agreed to investigate the case with me, and I started at the crime scene. If you take a look at the photograph on top um, at the Country Line Inn where she was seen, in the back of the inn, where there, there's a motel, uh, and her car was parked in the back area, um, not in the front of the hotel. That becomes significant later on, and I'll show you why. And across the street where her body was found in an after midnight club, after midnight means just that, that people were dancing and, and having a you know, good old time after 12 a.m. That parking lot was filled after 12 a.m. on a Tuesday night, but yet her, um, he apparently was alleged to have um, raped and murdered her in the field. There was a fence that used to be here. Her body was right over the fence, and in the back of that field, there were tire tracks leading... Um, to this field, it was um, uh, thought that maybe perhaps her body was dumped at a later time. Mm. At the time that I was investigating this, so was uh, um, a investigative reporter in Virginia Beach but, um, by the name of Joe Jackson. Um, he actually was investigating and looking at um, Albert Alberry, the prosecutor in this particular case, and he found that he had withheld evidence and had ethical, other ethical violations um, that you know pre prevented him from moving forward in his uh, request for uh, judgeship nomination following Odell's conviction. And I, I thought this was really interesting because I, if I thought, wow, this is not just Joe Odell's case, this might be a pattern that's that's happening across the board with other cases. And this was something not only that I was interested in, but the the investigative reporter was interested in as well. And as we started getting back and forth with questions and the media going back and forth. The knowledge that I acquired by studying and knowing these facts became my Bible. And in doing so, I became a very powerful tool to challenge some of the things that was coming out of the media. Nowadays, we call it fake news. Back then, in 1993, there was no such thing. I mean, we relied upon whatever people said, and we believed what people were saying in the media to be absolutely true. Um, that was not necessarily the case. Um, I knew that I needed help because I was just one individual, and I knew that if I just didn't, uh, if I did this on my own, I was uh, unsure about how far I would get. So I, I called upon Sister Helen Prejean after I decided to go to law school to pursue my quest for justice and other such cases. In my first year of law school, I called Helen. Um, Sister Helen Prejean, she agreed. Um, she's the author of Dead Man Walking, if, if you don't know. Um, 
she agreed to help me do my case, and we had our first press conference in Virginia trying to get attention for this individual. Back then, um, we didn't have the internet. I had to actually go to my former boss and ask him, how do I create an internet address? How do I get email? What do I do? I created the email, I created a site online. It was one of the first sites online trying to get a public forum for a death row inmate, and it ended up on the front page of the New York Times because it was unheard of back then. Uh, 24 hours in cyberspace picked it up, and it ended up, um, uh, one out of 50 photographs making a change in the world, in the digital world, um, and is now in the Smithsonian um, um, uh, Museum and Archives. From this, TV. this is the press it's conference from Sister Helen Prejean. The death row inmate gets some help from Sister Helen Prejean. You know her from the movie Dead Man Walking. He was convicted of raping and killing a Virginia Beach woman. Now, more than a decade later, death row inmate Joseph Odell is fighting for his life. And the Louisiana nun who wrote Dead Man Walking wants Odell to go free. Mike Gooding has our story. For 11 years, Joseph Roger Odell has maintained his innocence, steadfastly sticking to his story that he didn't rape and murder 44-year-old Virginia Beach Secretary Helen Shartner in February 1985. It's beyond my comprehension how anyone could send someone to die on the flimsy evidence they had, and there was no connection between me and the victim whatsoever. Odell's supporters have even argued the facts of the case over the Internet. A rising moment my fate decided I'm a dead man walking. Now Odell is receiving a high-profile helping hand dead from Sister Helen Prejean, whose book Dead Man Walking led to the Oscar-winning film of the same name. I'm here today because I want to see justice done for Joseph Odell. The state of Virginia is intent on executing him, and I believe that grave doubts have been raised about his guilt. Prejean and other Odell backers say new DNA evidence proves he did not commit the murder. It isn't the first time a DNA defense has been used in Virginia. Two years ago, convicted rapist Edward Honecker was freed by Governor Allen when DNA proved his innocence. I don't want anybody who is innocent spending time in prison. The, that's not justice. Eddie Honecker had a victim that, that stated that, that she, in fact, was raped by Eddie Honecker. Odell has absolutely no witnesses, nothing to connect him to this crime whatsoever. The governor may yet have a hand in the Odell case should the Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals fail to rule favorably for the defendant and then the U.S. Supreme Court does the same. Odell's last chance will rest with Allen. Mike Gooding, 13 News, Richmond. Virginia Beach Commonwealth Attorney Bob Humphrey says Odell is a cold-blooded killer who deserves to die. By the way, the governor's office has not commented. I continued my investigation and I knew that one of the things I had to do was verify that the, he had an alibi and that he actually was in a fight in Florida. I also had to verify and talk to the jailhouse snitch because I knew that his story was not consistent with the facts of the case. He testified at trial that Odell was seen dancing, drinking with, and talking with the victim, um, and because that she refused to have sex with him, he murdered her. Um, all other witnesses said that they had no connection whatsoever, so I knew something was not right. Uh, we had interviewed one of the police officers, and the police officer said that um, the, J Steve Watson wanted a deal, and he wasn't treated very kindly by the prosecution. So we decided to drive through the mountains of West Virginia, <laughs> and being a, a, a protected person from the East Coast, I looked at Richard Rayner and I said, Richard, do you have a gun in your pocket? And he said, no. And I said, well, what the heck kind of pro uh, investigator are you with no gun? We're walking to this area where people are not li li likely to li you know, really enjoy us. And I have to say, the moment my phone service died, I was scared. I was walking into an area uh, that I probably wasn't very welcome. I knew nothing about jailhouse snitches, but I knew one thing. And I knew that when you talk to people, you don't talk to them in an accusatory manner. That people have a, a, a reason for things that they do in life. And if you go at them one way, you're not going to get results. But if you sit there and you talk to them and you understand and you don't judge, you may get results. Well, Richard Reyna and I s sat with him and talked to him. Uh, we, sat, we actually did not leave for three days. We sat there, we developed a relationship with him, and, and you can see by that photograph there, 
Um, Stephen Watson is right there. Richard Raina is here. It doesn't look very much like he's intimidated, does it? Well, the prosecutor... Can you see that? Okay. All right, that. Is that better for you? Okay, so um, he's not really looking very intimidated, is he? But the prosecution said he was intimidated. And after uh, meeting with him, we knew that if we didn't set this up right, we were going to be in trouble. So he wrote a letter to the governor, and he said that he lied. He, wrote, he went on the news. He wrote a letter to the attorneys. He wanted to make it right. And here's what Steve Watson You're watching said. WVEC TV, Channel 13. Is this condemned man telling the truth when he says, I didn't do it? Some new testimony suggests he is. Good evening, I'm Regina Mobley. And I'm Terry Zahn. He is on death row, but could he be innocent? Joseph O'Dell was convicted 10 years ago for killing a Virginia Beach woman but he has always insisted he didn't do it. And now, as Rebecca Schramm tells us in this exclusive report, a key witness against Odell has changed his story. But they're very They both play together. These days, Steve Watson spends quiet time with his pets at his home in Elkins, West Virginia. Ten years ago, Watson was in a very different place. He was sharing a Virginia Beach jail cell with Joseph Odell. At Odell's trial, Watson testified Odell admitted he strangled and beat Helen Shartner to death. In an exclusive interview with 13 News, Steve Watson admits he lied on the witness stand. It's been eating at me for ten years now, and I want the truth to come out that he did not he did not confess. Watson has even forwarded a letter to Governor George Allen. In it, he writes, Odell never confessed to me. I made the story up, hoping the prosecutor would help me out. Watson says his lie was a long shot attempt to get a better deal for himself. Al Alberry, who prosecuted Odell, doesn't buy this new story. It's late in the game. He's uh, been induced, apparently, for reasons that I don't understand. In a phone conversation recorded four months ago, Watson complained to Prosecutor Al Berry he was being bothered by Odell's friends. Prosecutors say just because Steve Watson has changed his story, that doesn't mean Odell is innocent. They say there is still plenty of evidence in this case. The case could have been tried completely without Watson. The case was tried with hair and blood evidence found in Odell's car. It matched the victims. Tire tracks near where the victim's body was found matched the tires on Odell's car. Still, the defense says Watson's new story at least deserves a second look, especially since Odell's life is at stake. We hope and expect that this recantation and other exculpatory evidence that has come to light will be heard by the courts. Rebecca Schramm, 13 News. about this case, you would think, wow, there's blood evidence that match, matches, there's the overwhelming evidence. Well, the fact of the matter remains that there was not. The United States Supreme Court by Justice Blackmun, um, in, in a in an, an, an very rare statement, issued a statement and said, although Odell was procedurally barred by um, on his appellate process because his, his lawyers put the wrong caption on the appeal, they urged the courts to ha have a full hearing because of the possibility of a gross injustice of executing an innocent man because they recognized that the case was an entirely circumstantial case. By the time we got done with this case and because of the lack of integrity, because of the word, um, the usage of the word match uh, by the prosecution and the attorney general's office, the media thought there was overwhelming evidence of guilt. Keep in mind that an evidentiary hearing in 1994, um, it, uh, uh, by, and, and by all means, um, all witnesses, both for the, pro the Commonwealth and for the defense, the, uh, agreed that the only evidence was actually an exclusion. It was not a match. But they kept using the word, ter the terminology match in all of the court hearings and all of the media, such that me, who was just a law student at the time, was writing the attorney general's office, chastising them and saying, you can't do this. 
It's not a match, and it's unethical, and I cited the case law that proves so. Um, I was fighting an uphill battle because it was me. But <clears throat> what happened, and interesting so, this case started becoming a, a very controversial case because it was about DNA testing. Why not de test if you thought he's guilty, test, he's guilty, execute, that's it. Well, I mean, it, why wouldn't you do the testing? We wanted to do more DNA testing to prove that he was innocent, but they refused. Uh, afterwards, I decided to do continued testing um, of the record, and there were two huge boxes of evidence that was never looked at by the attorneys. I got hold of those two boxes. There were notes that were written by the um, original public defender, and the public defender did not want to hand the, the notes over to the appellate attorneys. That's rare and unheard of. Usually, you always cooperate with the appellate attorneys, and I wanted to know why. What was in these notes that they were afraid to show? Um, and so I got the notes and I invited the investigative reporter there because he wanted, he was in the midst of finalizing a story that was going to be front page, four pages in Virginia Beach about Do Odell's innocence. I started going through all of the, the evidence and I found evidence that was particularly disturbing to me. Um, Joe Jackson actually had shared information with me. Um, and we started becoming not really very much of a team, but um, looking for justice and looking for truth. In the court files, there was a, 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 um, a scientific uh, witness who was going to testify at trial, but because he was intimidated by the prosecution, um, claiming that they, they were going after him for the IRS for equipment in his office, he pretty much backed out. But he wrote a letter to the judge, and in his letter he wrote, I have run into many serious, and, um, new and serious omissions which make the necessary task of evaluating the evidence impossible to complete before the trial date. Furthermore, I have just had a meeting with Mr. Ray, it's the defense counsel, and investigator Ta Collins and discovered that extremely important physical evidence collected by the state was either never evaluated or analyzed and was analyzed and would not be introduced at trial. I was deceived by the Commonwealth as to its existence. At the time I picked up the evidence, I was assured by the sergeant that what I was in receipt of was all the physical evidence of the case. If this additional evidence contained facts substantiating Mr. Odell's position, it will never be brought to light by the Commonwealth attorney. I believe the sin of omission is just as serious as the sin of commission since it could lead to a, a miscarriage of justice. The Commonwealth has definitely morally and ethically committed the former. I was informed that soil and plant samples were taken from the crime scene. I was also informed that impression casting of footprints and tire tracks along with exemplars were obtained by um, investigators. Soil and debris particulate with these impressions could either put Odell at the crime scene or vindicate him. The state crime lab has not mentioned this evidence in any of the reports and did not even acknowledge or proffer its existence. The lack of Mr. Test's candor and cooperation in the matter of my physical evidence review is tantamount to the conce concealment of evidence. And in fact, it was. It took <clears throat> about uh, several, several months for them to finally admit that the footprint casting taken at the scene was not Joe O'Dell's footprint. In, in fact, they looked at the person who found the body, Joseph Moore. It was not his, not any of the police officers, and not Joe O'Dell's. Um, but yet, they were led initially to believe that it was his. In the, in the, in the box of information that I found, which basically took me to my knees, um, I found... Um, uh, the reason why they never did uh, saliva testing on the cigarette butt. Um, in the notes that, did, uh, that the, uh, the defense attorney did not want to turn over, I found an interview with Joseph Moore, who was the gentleman who found the body at 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, he claimed that when he found the body, he saw someone crouched in the, in the bushes, and he was pretty frightened. Um, he had, had, was standing over the body, and he was smoking a Marlboro cigarette, and he put that cigarette out on the ground near the body. It was likely his cigarette that they uh, claimed was Joe O'Dell's, even though it was a different brand. And 14 months later, they went to Joe O'Dell's car to try to get cigarettes to try to say it was his cigarette. But it was Joe Moore's cigarette. Um, right in front of me, although the prosecution claimed that her car keys, her umbrella, and pocketbook were, were, were never found in three separate statements and in the closing arguments, they never found her black umbrella. Right in front of me was a picture of a black umbrella, and with, the handle was bent. 
The wounds on her head were circular. It could have been uh, from, um, from the circular end of the, the umbrella. But they, they lied about not finding her belongings, and we, were, we, we wondered why. There was also uh, information about um, the, a room, that the victim had a room with um, other people, and indeed, uh, we were never able to prove that. But in the notes, there was evidence that there was a room that was looked at by the police, and it was room 203. If you remember that picture I showed you, the victim's car was parked in the back of the motel. Room 203 was right above where her car was found. Um, I did call the investigator um, of a traveler's insurance company who did an investigation. It was a civil lawsuit, and he, um, he remembered many years later that it was either room 302 or 203. Um, and so we had a lot of evidence that never got to trial. Steve El uh, uh, Jeff Elliott found the body, um, um, actually walked through the field 7.30 that morning, and there was no body there at 7.30 in the morning, uh, making it seem that obviously this might have been uh, put there later. And finally, uh, Michael Bodden uh, was called upon to look at the autopsy report, and there were art particles of food in her stomach. And he gave us an affidavit that there could not have... Um, that the victim had to have eaten within two hours of her death. She did not eat between 8.30 and 11.30 when she was at the bar. She was alleged to have been murdered around 12 o'clock. Odell seen in a fight across the parking lot, and we found the, the um, alibi who said that he was in a fight with him across town in a parking lot. So all these things were really controversial. And I decided, okay, this fine, it's going to be front page of the, uh, of the Virginia Beach pilot. But the prosecution didn't want that. And they were fighting against me every step of the way. And know that when you take a chance and you remove yourself from the norm and you're doing something different in the world, you are always going to be violently opposed. You're going to be criticized. It's going to be different. You're not going with the norm. And as Sister Helen Prejean said to me, it's kind of a lonely battle. But I decided that after hearing that the prosecution was um, going to sue the newspaper, and the newspaper said after a year and a half of investigation that they were not going to print this story because they didn't want to spend $250,000, I thought, are you kidding me? $250,000 is going to stop this story from coming forward after a year and a half of investigation? I'll be darned if I'm going to sit here and not do everything I can to put this out there to let everybody know. So I said, you could stop me in the United States, but you will not stop me in the world. And so I reached out to foreign press, and I contacted France and Italy and everywhere, and all of a sudden, it landed on the front page of the um, biggest newspaper in Italy. And when that happened, I was shocked to have gotten a phone call uh, from the Italian parliament. And the Italian parliament actually called me and, and invited me to Italy and said, would you come to Italy and talk about your story? I thought, well, sure, why not? Well, they started an international campaign. Um, this was done by uh, an artist there. And I met with um, some of the dign dignitaries in Italy. I met with the Italian um, senator, of, uh, four or five people in the Italian parliament um, who were really responsible for getting this going. I met with, um, it became such a big thing in Italy that 95% of people in Italy knew this story. Um, that meant that ju just about everyone in the country knew who Joe O'Dell was and his fight for innocence. In, in entering into the Italian parliament, I met with the president of the Senate, and if you guys dare talk about my hair in this picture, I will kill you. I will hunt you down. I swear to God, I'll find out where you live. And please, I, I, I mean, really, I will be, I will be innocent. <laughs> um, but I did meet with the president of the Senate. I met with um, the, uh, the first advisor to the president of, of Italy, and he met with um, President Clinton and asked for him to do DNA testing, stop the execution. We had a, um, a declaration in, um, in uh, Italy, the Italian parliament and the European parliament both passed a, re a resolution to please do DNA testing because we wanted to know the truth. I was not an anti-death penalty gal. I was actually a more wrongful convictions girl. Um, so we went around Italy and started fighting the cause. Um, this Mayor Palermo and, um, and um, the, Red Mayor, the Mayor Leo Luco Orlando in Palermo made Joseph O'Dell an honorary citizen. Believe it or not, he's the, um, he's the, uh, the mayor today, uh, many, many, many years later. 
Um, he was also a, a parliament member. I was received by the Vatican, and I was given a rosary by the Pope, and that was a huge honor. And I met with the Vatican's uh, newspaper ri uh, writer. He was amazing. And this started a worldwide discussion about the death penalty and DNA testing. Um, it was unheard of that this would ever happen. Uh, for the first time in the history, we had parliament members coming to Washington um, at, the, at the National Press Club where they uh, supported Joseph O'Dell, and there, there they are standing outside with signs fighting for Joe O'Dell. And the first time in the history of the United States, we had parliament members visiting death row. Uh, they wanted to meet Joseph O'Dell, and so they did, and... Um, during this time, um, they also requested to meet with the governor, and the governor refused. Um, it was also at this time um, that I decided that I needed to do something very critical if I was going to make a difference. Because if they were going to execute Joe O'Dell, I would have no way of proving that he was innocent. It was at a time in the legal landscape in this country that that, that would have made a huge impact in the criminal justice system. So I thought being, you know, the shy, innocent kind of person I am, not willing to go out on a limb. <clears throat> um, I believed that I was going to do something very different that could make a difference. And I have to tell you that if you worry about your reputation, if you're worried about other things, you're not going to step out of your comfort zone and do different things. So I was working with uh, Barry Sheck and Clive Stafford Smith and some of the best legal minds in the, in the country, and we came up with two ways to get the evidence if he was executed. One, the, um, with a petition by the Roman Catholic Diocese Church um, in the public interest. The second would be as a family member, and as a family member, you can get the evidence. And the family member did not want, the one sister that was alive did not want to co cooperate. So I thought, how the heck am I going to do this? And I thought, the only way I'm going to do it is to marry Joe O'Dell. Yes, marry Joe O'Dell. It was fodder for you would not believe how many things on, on the news. Um, right away, I was seen as a death row nut. You know, you can only imagine the things that were out there. The conservative person of me was upset by it. Um, so I did marry him, and ultimately I got the evidence. Um, I got the evidence and, and, and tried to do DNA testing. There was not enough DNA in, in the material to do DNA testing. I ultimately got the um, marriage annulled for interest in a social cause. Um, Joe O'Dell was, was um, then flown to Italy. It was his request to be buried in Italy. They received him in Italy where I had a private meeting with the Pope. And on my way over there, Mother Teresa actually phoned me while she was on her deathbed. And she invited me to visit her in Calcutta. Instead, I went to Italy and I met with the Pope. And they, uh, in a white glove ceremony, they buried um, Joe O'Dell and... Um, and that was the end of Joe's story. But it wasn't the end of the story for me uh, because you know, I still wanted to participate. This is uh, um, a US, former US attorney, uh, Ramsey Clark, at the um, 50th anniversary meeting. It wasn't the end of the story for me because I then had a 24-year uh, journey ahead of me in studying wrongful convictions. Right now, there are 2,113 exonerations in the country. Um, some of them are DNA related, some of them are not. Um, instead of them diminishing in number, we actually obviously are seeing an increase. If you take a look at the causes, they're done by mistaken identification, by uh, perjured um, testimony, false confessions, false or, for, um, or misleading scientific evidence, and also official misconduct. If you further take a look at the uh, breakdown by homicide and what have you, there's a, a, a graph depicting exactly the percentage of what, what happens um, and what's the cause of some of these um, wrongful convictions. But I will say, uh, on a study by the National Summit on Wrongful Convictions was done in 2013 by the International Chief of Police and Department of Justice, 75 subject matter experts were brought in. They made recommendations pertaining to eyewitness identification, false confessions, informants, investigative bias, and improving DNA um, techniques. Yet, in, that, in April of this year, Attorney Jeff Sessions, he actually disbanded a bipartisan national commission on forensic science. This is extremely critical because it was an independent commission um, set to make um, standardized uh, techniques and, and what have you throughout the United States to try to prevent some of these wrongful uh, convi uh, convictions. 
um, in 2017 also, there were 21,000 dr drug cases in Massachusetts that were overturned from, because one single lab person um, had wrote um, incorrect results, and some of them uh, purposefully. Um, I will say that things have not, and I'm overstepping my time here, so I'll, I'll stop now. But I will say the reason I wrote this book is to tell the backstory of what happens behind closed doors. That nowadays we might have known that there is sometimes fake news that goes out there, but back then if you don't know and you're reading information, you might believe everything that you read. The use of your words is so important, whether you use consistent, whether you, whether you hold yourself out to be an expert, and if, if you're not an expert, like I have one case and that's the, where that's happening, um, it, 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 it's, it's quite, it, it's, it's disturbing actually. Um, a case that I'm working on in, in Texas where there was per, uh, someone that, that said it was, that an accidental drowning was actually a homicide. She was excluded subsequently in two other murder cases from her trial testimony because she was not an expert. But yet in this particular case, she was allowed to um, um, uh, opine as an expert. Um, and why? Because they didn't do a proper Daubert hearing or a Kelly hearing, which is a, a hearing for you to admit uh, testimony in that regard. But so everything you do as, as, as a person. You might think that you're one person, but everything you do results in a chain of evidence that affects the criminal justice system. And so I might have been one person standing alone in this. By the time I was done, I had worldwide support because people wanted to know the truth. It doesn't have to be an adversarial system when you want the truth. We can all work together. And that's something that I think is ex extremely critical for us to realize. Be, you know, hold your integrity, do the right thing, don't let people talk you into doing something. You're not working for one side or the other. You want the truth. Because the truth is what's, what matters in the criminal justice system. We don't want to see people wrongly convicted. You know, that's what Governor Allen said. But did he, if, if that was true, then they would have done DNA testing. So anyway, I have to stop. Um, I'll answer many of your questions later. Um, I thank you so much for your time. You know, I love speaking to young people, old people, whoever. You can make a difference in this world. And please step out. The, I know I was referring to myself as one of the older ones. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lori. We just have a quick certificate for you, just for um, thanking you for attending our event. Thank you. Oh. All right, guys. Um, again, as we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, if you need to step out for a break, that's fine. Uh, we hope you're able to stay for the rest of our panelists. Um, I would like to introduce a very special person. His name is Herman Lindsay. Uh, Herman spent more than three years on Florida's notorious death row. And in July 2009, the Supreme Court of Florida ruled unanimously, seven to zero, that Herman Lindsay be acquitted and released from death row. He became the 23rd exonerated Florida death row survivor and the 133rd person to be exonerated from death row in the United States since 1973. Florida leads the nation in sending 27 innocent people to death row, some after 15 to 20 years and coming within days of their execution. No one really knows how many innocent people have been executed or how many more innocent people remain on death row or in our nation's prisons. So can we give a good Miami-Dade welcome to Herman Lindsay. I'm still trying to figure out am I fitting in the old or the young category, which. <laughs> uh, first of all, I wanna say I, I really thank you all for being here because, you know, Doing these events, you learn a lot. And one of the things you understand is that I can sit here and tell my story, and I can't change the world by myself. My name is Herman Lindsay. I was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for first degree premeditated murder, first degree felony murder, robbery with a deadly weapon. 
I was sentenced for a crime that I'd never even been around. There was no eyewitnesses, no fingerprints. There was no kind of evidence whatsoever. Only evidence they had was a jailhouse informant that said, I confessed to him. Now, as I tell my story, I don't want any of you to look at my story and have sympathy for what has happened to me. I want you to pay attention to my story because my story is actually reality. I'm the 23rd, and I was, that was 2009 I was released, and four more have came behind me. How many is actually behind the walls? And one day, someone in this room may be the one responsible for helping free those innocent ones. Back in 1994, allegedly a pawn shop got robbed. A lady, I can't remember her name, but apparently someone went in that pawn shop, tied the lady down with either rope or duct tape in a chair, put a gun in her head and pulled the trigger. Police had reason to believe that somebody that I was hanging around had something to do with it. And he was, they called him my god brother. Some police called him my cousin. The police investigated, started investigating everybody. And in 1994, they called, they called and uh, told me they want to interview me. They made it seem like they was trying to get information saying that my god brother slash cousin, we just gonna say cousin because that's confusing for me, but say that he was involved and they want to know what he was doing that day and then they wouldn't ask me what I was doing that day and everything and then they asked me, have I ever been to the pawn shop? After he described the pawn shop, told me the location and everything. I said, yeah, I've been there before. I said, I even punt my game there before, a Sega game. Y'all might be too young to know what a Sega game is. It's like the PlayStation 4, but it's the older model. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him I, I punt the, the, the game there, and I used the alias name. And the reason I told him I used the alias name is because I was supposed to went to court for something and I didn't go to court. So I used the alias name. They asked me other questions and I asked them, I answered the questions to the best of my knowledge. 12 years later, the detective that was over the case retired. His name was John King. Another detective took over the cold case divisions, named John Caruso, I think his name, for the Fort Lauderdale Police Department. He came to visit me. And when he came to visit me, I had no problem speaking with him. And he was asking me questions about things that happened 12 years ago. And I say to most of the questions, I don't remember. I'm not sure. I did not lie and say something different. I was saying, I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. I mean, if you think about it, some of us can't even remember what we did yesterday or what we ate yesterday. How do you expect me to remember something from 12 years ago that has no bearings or, um, in my life? It, I mean, it wasn't like the 4th of July of 1970 when I went off the spring break. So I don't remember. And 
And that's when I call it the fun started. This police officer went back in front of grand jury, got an indictment on murder on me. He used information that cannot be used in my trial against me in the grand jury. And if I'm not mistaken, any evidence that cannot be used against you in trial can, should not be presented in front of the grand jury, but it was presented, and I'm and again, I may be mistaken by that, but I'm pretty sure that it was it's supposed to be that way. And he got an indictment. So I'm like, okay, you got an indictment, they arrest me. 21 days, 30 days, state of file, uh, drop charges. I ain't have nothing to do with this, so, you know, it's nothing. Then 21 days went to turn into 30 days. Then the third days went to turn into six days. Then third day, six days turned into 90 days. And I was like, man, what's going on? Reality sunk on to me that they was really trying to, to prosecute me for something I didn't do. So I asked my attorney, which is in... When you're dealing with a death penalty case, you get two attorneys. You get one for the guilt phase, which is the trial, and one for the penalty phase, which they do mitigating, aggravating circumstances to determine whether you get life in prison or death. Well, I was having a discussion with my lawyer, and I say, put me in for a demand for speedy trial. He was like, we didn't do no depositions. We, we need to do this, we need to do this. And I'm like, man, listen, I didn't do this. I'm not going to sit here two and three years of my life waiting to fight a murder charge that I did not do. I'm not scared of this. After thinking about it, he put in the ban for speedy trial. Wow. That's when the real fun started. Because after 90 days, I finally got to see how it is to pick a jury. How difficult it is to pick a jury. You can imagine, for a murder child, you need 12 jurors and two alternates. We had to interview at least, at, at, at least on a, a death penalty case, at least the numbers of people that's in this room right now to pick 12 people. Why it's like that, I don't know. But we picked the jury. And while we was picking on the last stage, the prosecutor stepped to me. I was sitting at the desk, and the prosecutor said, listen, Herman, because we hadn't got on first name basis. I called him Dave, he called me Herman. We didn't got on first name basis. And he say, uh, listen, my boss will get mad, but I will offer you three years in prison right now for exchange for a manslaughter. Normally three years, I would have been out in what, a year and a half, two years. But with the instance I said, no, I didn't do this. I'm not, no, I'm not taking this. I'm not, I didn't do this. I'm not going to be a victim where y'all just close a case on me. No, I'm not going to take it. So we began opening arguments. And then we began putting on evidence. The first thing they put on was the medical examiner. And I think this might have contributed to my cause of getting convicted. But I don't know about anybody else. But if you're shown on a big screen TV like this here, a lady sitting there with a head, uh, holding her head, you're not going to be sitting there laughing. It's saddening to see that.
The second piece of evidence they brought in was my ex-wife, cousin. <laughs> he told them that I was questioning him about the incident, what happened on the news, and that they supposed to give him a $10,000 reward. He didn't say I did it. He just said I was questioning him about what was on the news. I don't recall that, but the second piece of evidence was my ex-wife. And you know, that, that, that was the, this, this is why I can't understand exactly uh, the people that's working in our justice system in the jury. That's why I think I do this with a passion because My ex-wife had gave a statement saying that on that day, she remember seeing it on the news and that me and my cousin uh, had a bag of jewelry and a Royal Crown bag. We took it to the flea market, we sold it. That was her statement. They called her to the stand and they was saying, they swore up, up under oath and the prosecutor was asking her about the deposition that she was giving and she would ask a question and he said, did you see him with a blue royal crown bag? She said, no. So she turned around and said, he say, did you understand the question? Did you see him with a blue royal crown bag that day of the murder with the jury in it? She said no. So the state attorney actually moved to impeach their own witness. And they went to going, going at it. I don't know what the chemistry is, but they seemed like they was the one married. And <laughs> <laughs> she turned around and said, on the stand in front of the jury, look, only reason I gave the deposition was because one, y'all, the detective came to my house threatening to take my son, threatening to take my kids, harassing my grandma, coming out to my job. I been told them I didn't know nothing, but I only said what they wanted me to say because they said they was gonna give me ten thousand dollars, which I didn't get. If you think she didn't say it, look at my trial transcript. Now, the next piece of evidence is very interesting. If you recall, I, I, I spoke at the beginning and I told Joe, I told them that I went and pawned my, uh, my game there at the pawn shop in a different name. They come up with this pink slip with my fingerprint on it and tell the jury that, you see, he was there at the pawn shop, weeks before casing out the place. This is his fingerprint that he used in a different name. First of all, if I had committed a crime, I am smart enough to know that the detective is not going to find my fingerprint if it's attached to somebody else's name on a pink slip. But they made the jury feel like I did this, and I never even let them know the truth in the beginning. The last piece of evidence, my homeboy. I call him my homeboy because I don't even know him, but I call him my homeboy, my best friend. This guy marks, this guy Mark Sims. Apparently in 94, him and my cousin, they was going around robbing pawn shops, breaking into pawn shops and everything. 
1994, they asked Mark Sims about this case because he was investigating in this case. He said he didn't know anything about it. 97, they asked. He said he didn't know anything about it. And mind you, they got him as, down as the prime suspect in the case as the actual gunman. But he was saying he didn't know nothing about it. They even got one of the videos where he was what he was charged with, where he walked into this store and his plane is there as camera. It's him. He walked in this store, asked the ca uh, cashier to give him the money. After the cashier gave him the money, he just shot the cashier. Mark Sims, 2005 or something like that, got sentenced in federal prison. Mark Sims turned around and called in 2005 and said, hey, you know what? Y'all help me out, I'll help y'all out. I know who did the murder. He said, I was, in the, I was in the jail cell with Herman Lindsay, and he confessed to doing this. Now, I was in jail for a ticket. You think I'm going to confess to somebody I don't know about something I didn't do? With that evidence there, and I don't leave nothing out, the jury came back and found me guilty of first-degree murder. In none of those statements did anyone say I committed the murder and none of them statements did anyone say I was there but Mark Sims. When the jury came back with the verdict, I was like in shock. I was like spaced out. I don't know if I hadn't smoked a joint or what, but I was out of it. And I was shocked but laughing. And I couldn't believe it. So now, after you get found guilty, you got the face of penalty phase where you got to pray and hope you don't get the death penalty. I don't want to die for somebody and do it. And I really don't want to be in life in prison for what I didn't do. But what can I do? I'm in the justice system. I'm behind bars. I can't run. I'm going to show you how God works. Between the guilt phase and the penalty phase, I was walking out to the elevator because I was the trustee that helped fees in the unit I was in. And guess who they, what they brought to me? They brought Mark Sims up to the elevator, taking him down to medical. Now, it's a sergeant and two officers there and two officers escorted me. I asked Mark Sims, I say, Mark, why are you lying on me, bro? You don't even know me. He told me, it's nothing personal. It's payback. I got to do what I got to do to set myself free. I'm like, hey, payback on what? What I done did to you? I got to go. Under the court standards procedures, that could qualify for newly discovered evidence and get me a new trial. So we, my attorney immediately filed for that. We bought, brought five officers in to testify to what they heard. My motion was denied. Turn around, when we was going up again for the motion, I was placed in the holding cell. And in the holding cell, they slammed that door. That's it. You in them but brick walls, metal. And guess who they put in the cell with me? I ain't going to even ask y'all what y'all would have did. I ain't going to even ask y'all about it. And the guy tell me, say, listen, ain't that's the one that's sitting there snitching on you? I say, he ain't snitching on me. Are you lying? But I don't. 
He's like, man, we should. I said, no, let God deal with him. Me and Mark sat there and had a talk. And apparently, Ronnie snitched on him in federal prison. So now he's trying to get Ronnie back. And he's trying to say he ain't put me in it. You know, he just said what he thought. I had 35 inmates come back up for another newly discovered evidence. 35. And my motion was denied. So now the day of the penalty phase come. And in the penalty phase, they do the aggravators why you should go. One was a robbery for when I was 14. I was conspiracy robbery. The other thing they used was from the conditions of the present charge that I'm being charged with that I had nothing to do with. Then we put on the mitigators. You know, I was a star football player. You know, I helped with my handicapped brothers and I was good in the community and stuff like that. I really wasn't a bad person. Now in the guilt phase, and this is the catch-22, and, 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 and this is a real catch-22 if you ever get in trouble. In the guilt, in the trial, it's a hard decision to decide whether you want to testify or not. In my case, I choose not to testify. And one of the reasons they, you choose not to testify is because if you t get on that stand, they could bring up the fact that you're convicted felon, and then people have their own views of you from that point. Then on the other hand, is the catch-21 is that if you don't speak in front of the jury, the jury going to feel like, well, why he didn't speak and defend himself? I didn't speak in the guilt phase. So I went to speaking in the penalty phase. And in the penalty phase, I turned around and um, oh no, I'm shaking my time because I don't want to in the penalty phase I took the stand the prosecutor cannot ask you questions concerning the guilt phase and the penalty phase but the prosecutor like we was on first name basis but now all of a sudden you done turned into this monster you turn around and you, tell, you, you ask me a question you ask me why did you put this lady in the chair, taped up and shooting the head, executioner style. I said I didn't do it. Now, right here, the same jury is determined whether I get life and death or the death penalty. I said I, I didn't do it. He asked me that question again, and I say I didn't do it. Then he put me on the spot. He turned into this monster. He say. So you mean to tell me the same jury that just found you guilty is, is wrong, is lying on you? What you say? You, I don't want to go to death penalty. You know, I don't want to die for this, you know. But I don't, I, I'm confused. So the best thing I say is I think they are mistaken. The jury came back eight to four and I received the death sentence. I could remember those words when they sentenced me right there. They say, we the people of Florida hereby now sentence you to die by lethal injection or means necessary. Remember what I said, because I'm going to come back to that. It say, we the people. When I got sentenced, I was immediately taken, not to my holding cell, but back to the infirmary where I had to be on suicide watch. By Four, about 2 o'clock that morning, 4 o'clock that morning, I was on a van, cycle here, going down, across. I thought I was Charles Manson, man, state up or something. And I was on a van headed to FSP. 
FSP is one of the prisons. It, actually, Florida State Prison is the only prison in the state of Florida. All other prisons are correctional institutions. But that's what housed the uh, death penalty inmates. And it was built, if I'm not mistaken, back in the 50s or 60s or something. So you know, it don't have AC or the modern technology where you got the ventilation and stuff like that. It got brick walls, iron bars. And when you go into death, when they go and take you to your housing, it's like you walking down a whole mile. And the only thing they telling people is move out the way dead man walking. I'm already scared because I'm around here these killers. And I had this perception that these people I'm going around is, I mean, they, monsters or whatever, you know, you know the first impression you have on a person that's uh, on death row, you think they, you know, this bad person, this monster. So I was afraid at first. And when we turn to go into the housing, this wing here houses you for while well, waiting execution. And this door over here is where the execution chambers is. And they make sure they let you know that's where you have your last meal. As I was sitting and waiting for direct appeal, I developed a sinus problem, which they gave me Tylenol for. The conditions inside those holding cells, it's like if it's 90 degrees outside, it feels like the index inside is something like 120. If it's cold outside and it's 20 below, it feels like it's way double the below. Most of those guys there have hearts. They look out for each other in a real brotherhood, like real brotherhood. And if you didn't really know where you was at, you wouldn't think these was the people that was actually there. I began to get so depressed and so full of anxiety and scared. And I mean, I just got found guilty of something I didn't do. Now I'm right here. I, Reality went to sinking in. I'm finna die for something I didn't do. Majority of the time, it takes 10, 20 years before they even realize you're innocent. And then you hoping that they catch it, the fact that you are innocent. <sighs> I used to vision myself away, you know, like I'm in a little story to fall asleep. Now, one thing about them, they will give you some psych drugs quick. And psych drugs to put you to sleep. But even then, that don't help you sleep. And the, you know the sad thing about it is that the support those boys get on death row with pen pals and stuff, that come from other countries. We Americans, we shy away from them because we feel like they're not human no more. But they actually human. If you was to meet me, you wouldn't think I was on death row. If you would meet some of the ones that's actually there, you wouldn't be on death row. But this, I'm going to finish my story, then I'm going to get it. <laughs> but it came the day when I watched my oral arguments on, on TV. Uh, and they, we get to watch uh, Florida State uh, TV there, and they show all the oral arguments 
And when I was giving my, just watching my oral arguments, man, we was in the cell like Rocky, boy. Because I'm talking about, my lawyer didn't really even have to say anything. The Florida Supreme Court was so outraged at how my case was dealt with. I mean, they, you could, they was fighting for me. The state attorney, they still asking her, what evidence do you have to hold this man on murder? But the state attorney kept trying to fight because that's their job. She didn't know what to do, really. But that's her job. And the Florida Supreme Court asked this question here. How can people that is sworn to work, hold, withhold the law those deputies that came in to testify on my behalf, how can they word be nothing towards a man that has so much motive to actually commit the crime? When they came back a couple of months later and I was at my holding cell and the, the sergeant, the lieutenant, and my site counselor came to me and they told me they were finna take my TV. Cause on Death Row we get our own TV, fan and stuff like that. You gotta pay for it, but you can get it. And um, they told me they gonna take it and I'm like, what did I do? I, I didn't do nothing. You know, they said, well, you got a DR. I'm like, huh, I got a DR, which is this merit report. They said, you, you got a DR right here. And they showed me the paper. It was the Florida Supreme Court opinion that ordered me not to go back to trial, but to release me from custody. My case became one of the top first cases in history, actually the first case in history, where all seven judges ruled unanimously that I shouldn't have never even been convicted, never even been on death row. But you know something? A lot of people say they have sympathy for me and they're sorry and stuff, but I don't want nobody to be sorry for me because you know why? If any of you read the Bible, all the great books that was written, that person had to go through something to write that book, to be that, that voice. And that's what I have become, the voice of those that's innocent on death row. But you know something that I want to say before I end my story is this. I'm going to ask y'all a question. Have y'all ever seen our justice system wrongfully convict anyone or execute anyone? Everybody saying our justice system is so bad, but did, do anybody know a case where a person been executed because... Our justice system say executing. Nobody? Nobody want to answer? Okay, let me explain. Because our justice system has never ordered an ex, uh, has never actually convicted anyone to sentence them to execution or s convicted them where they'll be placed in a position for wrongful conviction. Anytime a wrongful conviction come down, anytime execution come down, guess what? It's all because the jury decide. And that's one of the things we have to look at in the, as America, that we have a great justice system. But some of the people that is deciding the lives of it. I mean, how many of you all would get a jury, uh, uh, a notice for jury and don't want to go? Anybody here ever been on a jury? How many of y'all would actually want to participate on a jury? I see the ones that saying no. Let me tell you something about it. Our great system is, and you, uh, you got to understand, I'm not, when I say this, I'm not targeting the, the attorney. I'm not targeting the, the, the prosecutor or anything. But one thing the jury need to understand is 
in that courtroom is not about the best story. It's not about what you see on Criminal Mind that says that, okay, if they got him with this evidence or they got him like this, it was him. Because there's plenty of times when you thought it was the person that killed the butler on the train, it ain't the person that killed the butler on the train. So if y'all ever call for jury duty, it's our duty, man, as Americans, to sit there and make sure the person that you're on jury trial debating their lives get justice. You can't go in there and assume because I'm sitting behind this desk, I'm guilty. That's what our system's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be that we are innocent until we're proven guilty. But in most of the modern day system, this is how it is. We're guilty until proven innocent. And you know, I went to death row, got exonerated, and I never even got a thank you. I never got no conversation or nothing. But you know what my conversation is? My conversation is, is coming speaking out. And if anybody pay attention to my words, educate everybody about this problem we have. All these wrongful convictions, all these death sentences come from jurors. And when you're a potential juror, how would you feel if you made a decision to sentence me to death and the Florida Supreme Court said you're wrong? How would you feel? How would you feel if you, at the beginning you turned around and you found me not guilty because you paid attention that it was not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you feel a whole lot better, right? I'm not saying go in, the, in there and just go for the defendant. I'm just saying pay attention and that would make a great difference in our justice system to eliminate the wrongful convictions, the wrongful executions. Florida cannot say they haven't killed the innocent man. Majority of people take 18 to 20 years to get off of death row when they are exonerated. What if they done killed them before they can find that evidence? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Y'all do the Michael Jackson now. Woo! I was wrapping him up. I'm sorry. I know you want to hear more. Herman will be available towards the end. There's going to be question and answer session. So if you have a lot of questions to ask him, please do so. We present this certificate to you. Let's take a picture. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, again, if you need to take a potty break, please do that. But we're bringing up our next speaker because we're a little bit behind on time. I'd like to introduce the Honorable Carlos Martinez. He was the first Hispanic elected public defender in the US and was reelected. If you're gonna leave, do it quietly, please. Thank you. All right, they have to, yeah, we're in between class sessions, so I'm gonna keep going, okay was re-elected for the third time in 2016. Mr. Martinez manages an office with a $30 million budget and 400 employees handling approximately 75,000 cases each year. Mr. Martinez represented thousands of clients before working as an administrator. 
He serves on the Florida Bar Special Committee on Child and Parent Representation, the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Legal Aid and Indigent Defendants, the National Association for Public Defense Steering Committee, the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice Detention Risk Assessment Instrument Committee, and is a member of the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution's executive session on rethinking the role of the prosecutor in the community. He served as vice president of the Florida Public Defender Association, chaired the Florida Bar's Legal Needs on Children Committee, served on the Supreme Court of Florida Steering Committee on Drug Courts and the Steering Committee on Families and Children, and the Florida Blueprint Commission on Juvenile Justice. He has served on technical assistance and training teams across the United States and Latin America. Can we welcome Mr. Carlos Martinez? Good morning. I don't know about you, but I'm fired up. I am so ticked off. Every time I hear the story, the life story of an exoneree, it pisses me off. Because all of us can make a difference in the work that we do. Whether you're a prosecutor, whether you're a defense attorney, whether you're a judge, every single one of us can make a difference, whether you are a juror. And yet every single story of an exoneree involves a system failure, a system failure that we cannot bring back. Herman Lindsay will not get the time back that he spent behind bars. And it's not only time that he spent behind bars. Think about it. He spent time behind bars thinking he was going to die for something he did not do. How many of us had had a situation where we're accused of something that we did not do? And you're upset about it. But imagine if you're behind bars, if you're in an area where the cruelty by staff, and it is cruelty for them to walk him by the cell, by the area where he's going to be executed and telling him that. That to me is cruelty. The humanity is gone. When I hear about that, let me tell you, it pisses me off. But also when I look around this room, I see people who are going to make a difference. Because you're here learning about what's wrong with the system. And you can do something about it. In this room... There are going to be the future police officers. There are going to be the, be the future forensic analysts. There are going to be future judges. Hopefully, you'll be a juror as well and serve on a jury and make sure that you get everything right because it'll be in your hands. And some of you may end up being defense attorneys as well. I had two pages worth of bullet points, but I'm kind of ditching it because I got fired up about hearing such injustice. Let me tell you a little more about injustice. Let's not dance around it. The system, the system is rotten with racial injustice. The system is rotten with racial injustice. The exonerations that we heard, the number I heard is two thirds of the exonerations are black defendants. How can we look at the system and not think something is really wrong about this system when we have so many exonerations of a particular race? We have to be looking at that. Now, you heard some things, and uh, both speakers, the earlier speakers, they identified some issues with the Innocence Commission, uh, Innocence Projects that are going throughout the country. Uh, I want to give you a website, and I hope that you will look it up. Uh, you need to look up the Innocence Commission report. Florida had an Innocence Commission, and the report was issued, uh, and it is at www.flcourts.org. And that report identifies some really important pieces. And it's all part of the theme that you'll be hearing and some of the speakers you'll hear later. The issue with informants and jailhouse snitches, the issues with scientific evidence, particularly in the 90s and the 2000s uh, when we did not have the advances that we have today, 
the issues with preservation of evidence. In many cases, you can't test DNA because they did not preserve the evidence. So therefore, those people are still rotting in prison. The issue of professional responsibility, the prosecutor's responsibility, defense counsel responsibility, police, and everybody in the system, all those things are touched upon, particularly the issue of mistaken identification. Uh, I don't know about you, but I had an issue yesterday, and I've read a lot of reports, I've had a lot of cases in which I know there's an issue with cross-racial identification. But it was so clear to me yesterday, because I'm walking in my office, and I've been, I'm the public defender, I have 400 employees, my office handles about 75,000 cases, so it is very difficult for me to remember everybody's name. We have 400 employees, very difficult. So unless I'm seeing you on a regular basis, I probably will not know your name. So yesterday, I walk in the elevator, I run into one of our employees, I think she's either a clerk or a secretary. I don't remember her name, and I'm in an elevator full of people, and she's always been so pleasant, so nice. She walks into work, and you can see she's really happy to be at work. So yesterday, when I come in, I see all this stuff, I felt like I need to give her a call and just tell her how great it is to run into her in the elevator, and she has such great energy. She's African-American. Now, what I know is she's short, she's thin, right? So I know short and thin, and she was wearing braids. So we have photos of all the employees. So I go to my secretary, and I tried to explain to my secretary. She got out on the third floor. So of course, that we have five floors. That, that reduces the number. She got off on the third floor. She went left which means she's on the eastern half of the building, not the western half, so that even reduces it more. And I tell her she's African-American, short, thin. So of course she's thinking of who it could be, so she pops up the photos uh, you know, on her screen. And I'm looking at the photos, and all of a sudden there's one that sort of looks like her. Her hair is very different. Our photo, we took it on her first day at work, and that's not how she wears her hair now. So I'm looking at the photo, and all I'm thinking to myself, if she had committed a crime and I had to identify her, I could not say with certainty that it was her. And this is somebody that I work with, somebody that I run into. So imagine under the stress of a crime, a gun pointed at you, and you're trying to make a cross-racial identification it is very difficult to do it correctly. And that is one of the things that is the biggest problems with wrongful convictions. Now, there are lots of things that have been recommended in the past 10 or 15 years about how to reduce some of those things. And one of the issues was investigated bias, and in particular, uh, police lineups. The police, how many of you have seen a police lineup where they put the people in a room, right? That's not very common, that's just TV. What's typically common is the photo array. What used to be is that they would put the six photos uh, and they would give the photos to the person and have the person identify it. Florida changed the law this past year. So one of the things they're going to be doing is they have standardized procedures to make sure to eliminate investigative bias from that, from that lineup, so that the person that's showing the photos is not telling the person who they think it is that committed the crime. So there are certain rules that are in place. But we have not gone far enough. We really need to come up with a way to either prohibit or not allow uh, in, uh, on the street when you, have the photo, when you have the lineup where they drive the alleged victim by and they identified the person in handcuffs or without handcuffs right by the police car. And particularly in cross-racial -identif cross identification, uh, you have some issues about that. I mentioned the issue of race. And the issue of race, there are two things about race. One of them is explicit bias. You know what that's about. You've seen it. 
If you're watching any TV now, if you're watching any news whatsoever, if you're reading news on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else, you know what explicit bias is about because you have seen the demonstrations about that. But that is not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge of the court system is what's called unconscious bias. We all have it. We all have it. I did the test. You may want to do it online. Uh, it's the implicit association test. I, I did the test. Guess who I show lack of preference to? Anybody want to guess? It's other Hispanics. So my preference is for white people. What? Um, but there's some, there's some testing that is done. All of us have it. The reason I'm telling you that and I'm revealing that to you is because all of us have it. And you don't know when it's affecting you. And when the system is so backed up with cases, that's when we make mistakes. That's when all of us makes, make mistakes. If you get a defense attorney to ever tell you that they've never made a mistake, that defense attorney is lying to you. Because all of us have made mistakes. I look at how I, how I handled cases my first year. I'm horrified. Even though I had a training attorney, I had supervision, I worked nights and weekends. When you're inexperienced, you are going to make mistakes. The problem we have in the system, if you have the unconscious bias that you don't even know it's at play because it's unconscious, then you have chances for these horrible errors that happen in the system. So let me uh, jump to something that um, Herman Lindsay mentioned. Remember he told you that the prosecutor had offered a plea for three years and he would get, it was either attempted manslaughter or manslaughter, right? How many of you heard him say that? How many of you heard him? Okay. What did he get? Death penalty, right? Right? Because he was convicted of the highest possible charge. Now, we have a way defense attorneys, and Mr. Barrar has been a defense attorney for many years, and there's something that we call the trial tax, which is you will get a good plea offer if you decide not to go to trial. But if you risk trial, you will get typically a worse sentence had you not had you taken the plea? It's going to be a worse sentence. Now, in his particular case, there are only two options because of the type of charge. There were only two options for the jury to consider, life in prison and the death penalty. But shouldn't a prosecutor have reduced the charges? If the prosecutor thought that this case is worth just manslaughter, why would you not reduce it to manslaughter? Why? That's in the interest of justice. If you don't believe that you can prove something higher, why are you making an offer or why are you prosecuting this person for the higher charge? Those are some of the challenges that we see in the system, and that's called the trial tax, and we really need to eliminate that. I have two more points, even though I have a lot of things, but you have folks with forensics here, and I know we're running, we're running very late. How many of you have Netflix? All right, awesome. How many of you have seen the uh, show Making a Murderer? Okay, good. You are primed to all of this that you've seen, right? How many of you have seen the confession tapes, the documentary confession tapes? That's also on Netflix. I recommend you to watch it. Do not watch it at night like I did before I went to bed because I run an office and it horrified me because those were confessions that were extracted from people who did not commit crimes. And all of us always have a hard time trying to figure out how could somebody confess to something they did not do? The answer is in that show. That show is amazing. It's a documentary. It's real cases. And you need to know about real life because those are the things that happen. The last thing, actually, uh, I have two more points. I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying about the system. 
We are fortunate in Miami-Dade County because we have a litigation culture. In the state attorney's office, the public defender's office, in private practice, we have a litigation culture. What does that mean? It means that the adversarial system here works a little better than in other parts of the state. What does that mean? Adversarial. You have the prosecutor on one side, you have defense counsel on the other side, and they battle it out. So that way you try to get, the purpose of the system is to try to get at the truth. Because it's gonna be somewhere in between. That's the theory. And, but you have a very strong adversarial system in, in Miami-Dade County. When you look at the exonerations that have happened around the state, you are not going to see them from Miami. You're not gonna see them from Miami. You're just not gonna see them from Miami. You've had a bunch in Broward, and you know, the deeper you get, the further north you go, the further south you go uh, in Florida. So there's a lot of injustice that has been happening for many years. And sometimes it's well-meaning people who are just not realizing they're doing the wrong thing. They become too overzealous. It, the win becomes more important than the fact that you're going to impact a human being like Herman Lindsay and keep taking him away from his family for the number of years that he was there. And that countless number of people that have gone through without having that opportunity. So there are several things that have to change because we've talked about some of the causes, some of the consequences, the real life consequences, but there are some remedies that we could do. I mentioned some to you that are in the Innocence, uh, uh, the Innocence Commission report. There's a lot of information on the web that you can find. What are some things that we can do better in the system uh, to improve it? But there really is, to me, the biggest problem that we have in the system is the system has become a system of pleas over the last 30 years. I know Mr. Barrar knows, but we've been around a long time. Uh, when I started with the office, we were trying a lot of cases. My first year, I had 12 jury trials, which really wasn't that much in comparison to my peers. But right now, the system maybe has 200 jury trials in the felony division a year, 300 jury trials. We don't have jury trials because there's a trial tax and there's also the plea tax. Florida, the worst thing Florida did was in 1998, Florida actually changed its statutes for the criminal justice system to become a system of punishment. So it's called the punishment code. It's not called rehabilitation. So it's not even a purpose of the system to rehabilitate. The only purpose of the system is to punish. So when you have a system that just punishes and doesn't rehabilitate, it's a system that nationwide is costing 80 billion a year. 80 billion a year. You know what kind of money but we do without money, rebuilding infrastructure, doing all sorts of things that we could do. But instead, we have a prison system that is pulling in a lot of low-level offenders. And Florida is still pulling in a lot of low-level offenders. And when it doesn't pull them in to the prison system, it pulls them into the poverty system. This is what I mean by that. They will make a plea offer for credit time served. Credit time served means the time that the person did from arrest to this hearing, that time is credited as your sentence and your case is over and done with. The problem with that is if it's a felony, you lose a whole host of rights. It's not just voting. It affects employment. It affects scholarships. It affects a lot of things, and you have the consequences that will be passed out later. Uh, but there's a sheet here, though. It's a two-page consequences for you to get an idea about that. So the problem is that there are hundreds of thousands of pleas, which means for all intents and purposes, it's a conviction. Even if they give you something that's called in Florida withhold adjudication, 
it doesn't matter. An employer is going to look at it and think you're a felon or think you're a criminal. They look at it. Sometimes I've had some employers actually read a criminal record and tell me, oh, yeah, this person has a criminal record. When I look at the, uh, the printout and the printout only has a dismissal. But the employer just looks at the fact that the person was arrested, looks at the name of the charge, and all of a sudden assumes all that. So that is a problem that we have with Florida. We have the sealing and expungement system in Florida doesn't work because you can only seal or expunge one charge in a lifetime. And if you ever pled guilty or were convicted of one, so it doesn't show a withhold, you can't even seal that. Even though this happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you cannot seal that. So Florida does not believe in rehabilitation. Our laws don't reflect that. And our laws do not reflect redemption. So I'll leave you with this thought. When you look at capital death penalty exonerees, you heard the number. And you heard the number from around Florida and around the country. Those get the attention because it's the ultimate penalty. The ones that don't get the attention are the tens of thousands every year in Florida where that person is taking a plea of guilty for convenience because they don't want to face the prison term. They want to get out of jail. They want to get back into the community. So to me, the whole idea of wrongful convictions extends to the lowest level. The only way that we can have a truly fair system, number one, stop prosecuting all this nonsense. There are a lot of low-level offenses that should never be crimes. Driving with a license suspended, give me a break. In Miami-Dade County, we have 550,000 people with a suspended driver's license. 500, half a million people with a suspended driver's license. And about 400,000 of those, it's because they cannot pay the tickets. They cannot pay the amount of fees and fines that they have. So we need, to, we need to change that. That's an important piece uh, in the system. And we need to focus our resources on the more serious crimes. I live in Miami-Dade County. I want to be free from crime. Just because I'm the public defender doesn't mean, or just because Bob is a, a defense attorney, doesn't mean that he wants rampant crime. We represent people that are accused of crimes. And we fight for the Constitution. But as a citizen, I see what our system is doing, and our system is not doing what it needs to do in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of putting the resources in the most serious crimes so that you don't have the travesty that happens when you have an innocent person convicted and sent to prison. So we need to fund the system appropriately for the serious crimes that are a real threat to our public safety. And take out all those other things. You can put them either as civil citations, you can divert them from the system. You don't need prosecutorial or judicial or defense resources in those cases because they clog up the system and it allows the injustices that we heard about today in both instances to take place. So. You're our future. We're counting on you to keep up the fight. We're counting on you to make sure that you keep us all honest. You keep the police honest, the defense honest, the prosecution, the judges, the juries, all of us, all of us owe it to the system to make sure that it's a fair system than what it is today. So thank you for your attention and have a great day. for Carlos, so thank you for coming. Thank you very much. You need a picture. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I see a lot of jitters. We're going to take a 10-minute break, okay? We have th 10 minutes, 11.22.
please be back here. We have three wonderful speakers to conclude the event from the prosecutor's office, the crime lab, and from FIU. And coffees to the left, bathrooms in the back, and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Get back up here. Again, thank you all for coming today. We think there's so many important messages that are being spoken. So thank you all for your support for the college, for justice, um, and for being here. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Her name is Vivian Del Rio. She's an assistant state attorney. Criminal law practice in many different areas, including prosecution of criminal cases in county court, juvenile court and circuit court, the felony screening unit, and the post-conviction legal unit. She had, she's the head of the post-conviction unit within the legal appellate division of the Miami-Dade County State Attorney Office, responsible for researching and writing legal briefs, presenting oral argument, and litigating evidentiary hearings. In addition, meeting with the trial division prosecutors to provide assistance with post-conviction motions, habeas petitions, written pleadings, and other legal matters. The majority of post-conviction motions are filed by violent offenders, com criminals, serving life sentences. Many assert claims of actual innocence, requiring extensive record review and investigation. Hundreds of post-conviction motions are handled by the unit on a yearly basis, and most of the response briefs are sent to the Third District Court of Appeal for appellate review. The position also entails supervision and training of legal interns to help keep us up with the high to help keep up with the high volume of cases. Taught a CLE immediate level course on April 27th of 2017 on post-conviction motions. She's also published a manual on electronic decision tree through the training portal of Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office to assist prosecutors tasked with filing responses to post-conviction motions. She's a member of the parole committee that represents the state attorney's office at parole hearings in Tallahassee. Please welcome Vivian Del Rio. Thank you for welcoming me. I want to thank every, all the speakers that came before me. Um, everybody did a fantastic job of creating awareness on this incredibly important topic of uh, actual innocence and wrongful convictions. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Here in the state of Florida, prior to 1963, if you were a person who had gone to trial, had been found guilty, and had gone through the appeals process, and you were actually innocent, you had no recourse. Uh, there was no mechanism in place in the state of Florida prior to 1963 uh, for post-conviction. So what happened in 1963 is the case of Gideon versus Wainwright. Um, this case took place in Panama City, and essentially it involved somebody who was convicted and who was actually innocent. And that case, uh, sort of turned our legal system on its head and the Florida legislature realized we need a rule of criminal procedure to redress wrongs. And at that point in time, uh, our first rule of criminal procedure came into, into being and that rule one became rule three and that rule is now rule 3.850, um, which is our post-conviction rule. And under the rule, after an individual uh, is found guilty at trial, they have an appellate process, and after the appeal, they can file post-conviction motions. Okay, so I'm the head of the post-conviction unit, and a large quantity of the cases that come before me assert actual innocence. Doesn't mean that everybody that files these motions is actually innocent, but the assertion is there, and of course, they're taken very seriously. And one of the things that I do in my unit is extensive record review, reviewing trial transcripts. When I first took over the unit, I was haunted by the idea of actual innocence and, and individuals in the prison systems who had not committed the crime. And what I did, I did a lot of research. I um, read everything that Barry Sheck wrote 
Um, Ms. St. John mentioned him. He's one of the pioneers in wrongful convictions, as well as um, John Holloway from the University of Pennsylvania. And I tried to create a unit where I could examine these cases um, with an unbiased uh, eye and with the goal of, of trying to make the process as fair as humanly possible. To that end, I created a mission statement, and I'm going to read that mission statement to you. The mission of the post-conviction unit of the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office is to ensure justice by seeking the truth, protecting the innocent, convicting the guilty, and preserving the dignity of victims and their families. Although the accuracy of a conviction has always been part of the state attorney's office mandate, we recognize our ethical obligation to continue seeking justice. The post-conviction unit of the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office is committed to upholding full equality under the law and avoiding unjust results, thereby instilling security and trust in its citizens. So why would somebody that works at the state attorney's office be consumed with making sure that there are just results, that justice is served, and that there are no actually innocent individuals um, serving time in prison. The obvious reason is, and we, we heard uh, Herman Lindsay's story, we heard uh, Miss St. John tell her experience with an, uh, an exoneree, is we don't want the wrong person serving time in prison. Aside from the moral implications, the ethical, um, the lack of integrity, it means that the true perpetrator is still out in the community. So that the answer is obvious, that we want to make sure, if we're going to protect the community, we want to make sure that the, the right person that committed the crime is the person who is serving the time. Uh, and then second of all is that when we hear these stories of exonerations and wrongful convictions and how the process has broken down, it shakes our confidence in the system. In order to have a just system, a just culture, we all want to believe that the system is, is doing its best to weed out the cases where there's a lack of evidence, where there's a misidentification, where there's a false confession, and how do we weed those cases out? How, how we get to that point um, is something that became of supreme importance to me in running my unit. Um, Carlos Martinez spoke at length about how you're not going to find a lot of wrong, wrongly convicted individuals coming out of Dade County. And that is a testament, number one, to his office, sets the bar very, very high. And, and the legal community here in Miami-Dade County, we have Bob Barrar, who's part of that legal community, sets the bar high so that we as state attorneys have to do our jobs and do it very, very well. And part of doing that job is Ma and, and making sure that the common pitfalls that lead to wrongful convictions are avoided. Um, so the number one leading cause for wrongful convictions is a misidentification by a witness. And recognizing that, the Florida legislature has now passed legislation, passed in July, requiring police departments to put in place certain procedures that will eliminate or help eliminate those problems. So one of those procedures that Mr. Martinez spoke about is the, the double blind, which means that the police officer who's showing the photo lineup has no idea who the real you know, perpetrator is. And that eliminates some of the bias um, because the person that's administering the test doesn't know the answer. So that's one um, procedure that's in place. Another procedure that's being, that's, that's uh, come about as a result of, of this enhanced awareness is that a lot of police departments are now taping the pre-interview stage, um, which is, you know, uh, and that has to do with cases of false confession. Most of the time, the um, individuals alleging that their confession was falsely made were claiming that it was at the time period before 
the police officer pressed or the detective pressed play, whether it was being taped or it was videos. Um, so what is being done now is that that time period is all being recorded. So from the, the moment that the individual is brought in to speak to the detective, um, it's, there's a recording that's then memorialized and it will keep everybody honest and it'll also hopefully cut back on um, allegations that there are false uh, confessions. Now, I, I do take the false confession claims seriously and when I have actual innocence claims that claim that they gave a false confession, I do look very, very closely at them. Now, what are some of the things that I look for to weed out the ones that are probably not true false confessions? One of the main things is, did the person, did the individual confessing give the police a certain piece of information that there's no possible way the police officer would have known that? Okay, that, that is a really good indicator. So one of the cases that I'm working on right now, um, there was an allegation of a false confession, but when I was reading the confession, the individual conf uh, told the detectives where he hid the clothes that he wore when he committed the crime. And the police then went the following day and they recovered that clothing and I had the, um, you know, the time that the clothing was logged in uh, into evidence and it matched up. And, and that was something that I said, okay, there's no possible way that this is a false confession because there's uh, how would the police have known about the clothing and what how he dis disposed of the clothing had that not been uh, been provided. So those kinds of things are things that um, you know as state attorneys we can we can uh, look to sort of weed out because there are literally hundreds of cases that come into the post conviction unit with claims of actual innocence and we want to be able to identify the ones that are viable, that, that have a chance that, okay, maybe this person is actually innocent. And those, those are the cases that we wanna focus on. So the ones that there's no, or it's very unlikely that the person's actually innocent, let's eliminate those and let's focus on the ones. For example, a case with a one witness um, and there's a, a misidentification, that's a case that needs to be looked at carefully because when there is a one witness identification and that's the whole case is built around that, there could be mistakes made. Another thing that I, um, that I do is that I, I have uh, interns that work in my unit. One of my interns is here today, Judy, raise your hand. <laughs> and the reason that I like having interns help me in my unit is because they're not employees of the state attorney's office. So they don't have anything at stake. Um, if I ask an intern, I want you to review this claim of actual innocence, look at it carefully. She doesn't know the prosecutor who tried that case. She doesn't have an allegiance to the prosecutor, the police officer. She doesn't have any of those connections. And this is a, an unbiased opinion that can do research on a particular case or a particular allegation of, of wrongful innocence without any of the, of, of the trappings, without any of the um, possible pitfalls that somebody who is investigating their own colleagues and might feel a certain allegiance would feel. So the, um, the use of interns has been something that, that I think has been a very positive and, and helpful um, system. So I wanna talk a little bit about post-conviction motions. At the present time in the state of Florida, if you are someone in prison and you're actually innocent, there is no, under, under Rule 3.850, there is no actual innocence um, claim that you can make that will entitle you to an evidentiary hearing. Okay, what will entitle you to an evidentiary hearing and to have your case looked at a second time? You need to make a claim of either newly discovered evidence, which means that there is new evidence that has come to the surface that was not available at the time of your trial, or you can make a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel, which essentially you're saying that my lawyer really dropped the ball. There was a lot of evidence out there. There were witnesses he could have spoken to. There were alibi witnesses. There was, um, you know, there were, uh, 
evidence that was gathered that wasn't tested, whatever uh, the case is that the attorney did not do their job as far as doing, conducting a thorough investigation and finding evidence that could exonerate their client. Um, the third thing I want to talk to, uh, oh, going back to, um, to the cases of ineffective assistance of counsel, I want to just mention briefly Strickland versus Washington is the 1984 U.S. Supreme Court case that set the standard for ineffective assistance of counsel. And in order for somebody to get a new trial based on that, there's two prongs to Strickland that an individual has to prove. The first one is the performance prong, which means that my lawyer did something that no reasonable attorney would do or, or would have not done. And then the second prong is the prejudice prong, which essentially means that because of my lawyer's errors, I was found guilty. And had my lawyer done his job correctly, I would have probably been found, I would have been acquitted at trial. So the, that is the standard. Um, and then a little bit about our office. Um, in 2003, the, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office started a justice project. And essentially, what happened in 2003 was that um, the DNA evidence became much more, the, the science of DNA became much more sophisticated and readily available. So what our office did was, we essentially put it out there. If there's anybody in prison that believes that they're innocent and would like, and, and that we may have evidence in your case, and you would like that evidence tested because you believe that it could exonerate you, we will test the evidence for DNA. And as a result of that, our office retested and sometimes uh, tested for the first time because there was many items of evidence that had never been tested because DNA didn't exist at the time when these pieces of evidence were collected by the police. So what we did is we went back and tested hundreds if not thousands of items of evidence to look for um, exculpatory, uh, you know, like Ms. St. John spoke about where it was not a match um, or, or it came back to another individual, not the individual who was convicted. Um, as a result of that, one of the most famous uh, cases is a case of, in 2005, Luis Diaz was exonerated, and he was um, known at the time as the Bird Road Rapist, and he had been um, charged with raping 14 women in, uh, in the Coral Gables area, and he had served 25 years in prison, and he was um, exonerated uh, in 2005 as a result of DNA evidence. Um, so we continue to, um, you know, our, our office uh, is, is an office that is, we, our motto is to seek justice and it's not to convict. So we are different from um, Mr. Martinez's office. They have, they represent actual clients and because of that, they have an obligation to, uh, to be true advocates when they go to court. Our obligation is to seek the truth. It's a little bit different, um, and we. It, it's on the one hand, it uh, gives us the opportunity to really do the right thing. And uh, I know that my office, when we do our interviews, one of the questions that we often ask is we give you know hypotheticals, and we say, for example, okay, so let's say that you have a you're undergoing plea negotiations, and on Monday, the defendant is supposed to ta be taking a plea. But over the weekend, you find out that your star victim dies. What do you do? Do you walk into court on Monday and go through with a plea knowing that your victim has died and that you probably, if you had to go to trial, you can no longer prosecute this case? What do you do? That's the example. If any of you here are going to apply to the state attorney's office, remember that hypothetical because you might get it. And so that, that's an example of the kinds of employees that our office is looking for. We're looking for individuals who are committed to seeking the truth and not just being um, strong advocates for the state. There is another important case that our, that our office was involved in, which is the Richardson case. And I actually have a guest 
um, and his name is Bob Barrar. He's a criminal defense attorney who represented Mr. Richardson. This is a, a famous exoneration case that um, he's going to tell you more about. So thank you all for your attention. Well, let me first thank everyone for being here, and especially Mrs. Del Rio for asking me to come speak to you all. And uh, I'd like to first say something that Carlos Martinez said, and that's once you leave Miami-Dade County, the further north you get, justice tends to go south. My, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office is really, and I've handled cases not only all over the state, but all over the country the best I've ever come into contact with. They truly seek justice. And that leads me to the case of James Richardson. James Richardson was a very, very poor African-American that in 1967 was charged with poisoning his seven children. He was arrested, and at the time of his arrest, you can only imagine the publicity that was going on he was tried and convicted in the papers, and this was in DeSoto County, which is, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, geographically Florida, but we're talking about the middle of the state. Not too far, half, about halfway between Orlando and Tampa. But as I said, he was tried and convicted in the press, and while he's awaiting trial, the prosecution is sending inner office memos and memos to the investigators that we really, really need to investigate this case because otherwise we're going to be embarrassed by the press because we have no case. So what happens? Well, something that uh, Mr. Lindsay touched on, Mr. Martinez touched on, and anybody who's involved in the criminal justice system, as Ms. St. John especially touched on, lo and behold, we have the jailhouse snitch. I believe, as I recall, three of them popped up, and they all said, James confessed to me. Well, he goes to trial, he's convicted, sentenced to death. And quite frankly, if the United States Supreme Court had not temporarily outlawed the death penalty, he'd be dead today. So we fast forward this to, to the mid-1980s, mid about 20 years after he's convicted. There's a fellow by the name of Remus Griffin, who happens to be dating one of, the former one of the former prosecutor's secretaries, and she tells him a story. She tells him, you know, there's really a lot of evidence in the prosecutor's box that was never turned over to the defense attorneys, which was not me. But, so what she does, she tells James, excuse me, tells Remus Griffin, and Remus not the nicest guy, because Remus has been prosecuted by the DeSoto County, excuse me, DeSoto County State Attorney's Office. What does he do? He goes in the State Attorney's Office and steals their file. And in there is a lot of exculpatory evidence. It makes, it way to, makes its way to my partner's office. At the time, his name was Ellis Rubin. He passed away in 2006. So. As a result of this box of evidence, Governor Martinez gets involved, and what does he do? He decides to appoint a special prosecutor. He doesn't let the DeSoto County State Attorney's Office prosecute and look at the case because they have their own issues and problems with what they did regarding their misconduct. So who gets appointed? Janet Reno. And those of you who are a lot younger than I, Janet Reno was the former state attorney here in Miami-Dade County and also former attorney general. She assigns a, a complete staff to do a complete investigation. And the result of that investigation is that Mr. Ro Mr. Richardson was not only wrongfully convicted, wrongfully accused. So ask, we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? We have seven children who are dead. There's no question about that. Mr. Richardson and his wife were out picking oranges 
at the time these kids died. They went to school, they came home, they ate some food, they go back to school. Most of them die at school, a couple of them die at the hospital. He gets accused right away. The prosecution fabricates a motive. The motive was $500 of life insurance per child that was supposedly purchased you know, a couple weeks before their death. Well, the premium was never paid. The life insurance never came into effect. It was phony. But that's not what they told the jury. So while this is being investigated, as I said, the prosecution comes up with three jailhouse snitches that supposedly say Mr. Richardson confessed to them. And mind you, in this box of evidence, there is evidence to show that these three gentlemen perjured themselves on the witness stand. But of course, that doesn't make its way to Mr. Richardson's attorneys at the time. So who killed these seven children? There was a babysitter that took care of the kids that day because, as I said, James and his wife were out in the orange field picking oranges. And it just so happened this babysitter had killed her two former husbands, one of which by poisoning, which is the same method by which these children died. They were poisoned. Another one, as I recall, was the other husband, I think, was shot. But uh, she really wasn't a suspect. The sheriff at the time, there's a lot of rumors about whether or not he was involved with someone in her family. And as a matter of fact, as part of the investigation at the Dade State Attorney's Office, the sheriff had to give a DNA specimen. And uh, nothing ever came of that. I have my own opinions why. I talked to the lead investigator at the state attorney's office, and uh, enough said about that. But it just so happened as everybody in the community is scared to death because they're thinking, geez, maybe there's some kind of poison that's out in the fields, and these people, it could affect our kids. Well, the babysitter is sitting on her porch, calm as can be, laughing, enjoying life, and that in and itself should have sent up a red flag. But what else should have sent up a red flag is the following. The sheriff's office did a complete search, not once, not twice, but three times of the entire area of the Richardson home, the shed, you name it. So found nothing. All of a sudden, like on the fourth day, or the fourth time they searched, at the behest of the babysitter, all of a sudden, voila, the poison appears. She directs him to the very place. And uh, so between that and the jailhouse snitches and the falsification of the so-called motive, he's convicted, put on death row. And as I said, 20 years later, the file makes, it way, makes its way to my partner's office. The Dade State Attorney's Office gets appointed by Governor Martinez. And as I said, the reason the DeSoto County State Attorney's Office was not allowed to investigate this case is they were under investigation themselves, the lawyers, for misconduct, not only from the Florida bar, but also possible criminal penalties for what was going on during that trial. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations had passed, so nothing happened. And I don't even know if anything happened with the bar, quite frankly. It's been so many years. But the Dade State Attorney's Office concludes that Mr. Richardson was wrongfully accused. And not only is he not retried, but the case is dismissed. Then you fast forward probably another, let's see, 15 years and Mr. Richardson applies to be a wrongfully incarcerated person seeking compensation because Florida has a, now has a statute that allows for wrongfully incarcerated individuals to seek money for the time they spent in prison. 
Mr. Richardson spent about uh, 10 years on death row and another 10 years in prison before he was ultimately released. Unfortunately, all the evidence has been destroyed. No DNA. I mean, back in the 1960s, there was no DNA anyway. But fast forward to today, all the physical evidence has been destroyed, so all you have was a bunch of perjured testimony and Mr. Richardson's own words that I didn't do it. And to Mr. Richardson's credit, he's probably the kindest hearted person I've ever met because to this day, he has no ill will towards anybody that did him so wrong. But I don't know if all the stories end this well, but uh, I'm happy to say Mr. Richardson is the beneficiary of a million dollar settlement that uh, pays him an annuity every year. But uh, I can't even imagine what it's like to be in prison for 20 years for a crime you didn't commit, especially when you're accused of killing your children. It was a horrible, horrible thing. But uh, it goes to show you that it can happen, it does happen, and uh, especially if you're an impoverished person, and quite frankly, and every, a lot of people have touched on this, especially if you're in a minority. Mr. Richardson was a very, very poor African-American individual, and the prosecution and the police and the sheriff's office needed to pin it on someone because you can only imagine what it's like when you have seven innocent children taken down in their prime. But uh, that's my story, or actually James's story, and uh, that's what happened. Did someone have a question? Oh, the babysitter. I almost forgot. Great question. The babysitter confessed. But that was long after Mr. Richardson went to prison. She was in a mental institution, and at the hearings regarding whether or not Mr. Richardson would be compensated, the prosecution fought her. Well, let me go back one second. When it came to the issue of whether or not Mr. Richardson would, Richardson would be compensated, the DeSoto County State Attorney's Office resurfaced, resurfaced and fought any compensation to be paid to Mr. Richardson and argued that her confession was not reliable because she had been in a mental institution. And the reason why she did what she did was a couple months before the children were murdered, James had taken her husband up to Jacksonville. And he, not James, but the babysitter's husband found another woman. As a result of being introduced to that woman by James. So she goes back and exacts her revenge. And her revenge was killing those seven innocent children. Yes, you have a question also? Ah, uh, they haven't been together. She, she left him when he, he was in prison for 20 years. She's, she hasn't been involved with him really since then. Although I will say this, she didn't believe he did it. But nonetheless, even though she didn't believe he did it, she couldn't, she couldn't see it in her mind or her heart to stay with him because he was in prison so long. She moved on. Thank you for your time. It's a great program. And uh, that's it. Thank you.
two more speakers. Thank you all. All right, so we have Dr. Schreber Kompo. I hope I said that right. An associate professor at FIU and the co-director of the Legal Psychology Doctoral Program, where you all can go once you get your bachelor's. Her research focuses on investigative interviewing and witness memory, especially in the context of vulnerable witnesses. She's also examining real-world interviewers' perceptions, experiences, and behaviors, and confirmatory bias in a variety of settings, including witness and victim interviewing and forensic expertise. She has been an invited speaker on numerous occasions, including the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Forensic Research Institute, Miami-Dade Forensic Services Bureau, the Dade County and Allegheny County Public Defender's Office of Texas, Criminal Defense Attorneys Association, the FBI, at a university in Sweden, another university in Texas. She's published over 25 peer-reviewed articles, co-authored 70 presentations at national and international conferences, is an associate editor for Applied Cognitive Psychology and on the editorial board of the APA journal Psychology, Public Policy, and the Law. She works with law enforcement agencies on research and investigative interviewing training and has consulted in various legal cases. Her in investigative interviewing lab involves a variety of undergraduate and graduate projects in the area of witness and victim interviewing and memory, and her lab's research has been funded by several institutions. So let's welcome Dr. Compo, please. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. A lot of people are leaving. Uh, I promise it's going to be an interesting <laughs> presentation. Um, I'm sitting down. I'm on the tail end of the flu from hell. So in case you're wondering why I'm sitting down, so I just don't want to have a Wendy Williams moment. Um, so I'm talking today about the signs of wrongful convictions and the good news in this, if I may. Um, if there is such a thing as a silver lining in these horrible stories. Um, and so the silver lining, in short, is that psychological science and research really has developed a deep and good understanding of what to do and what not to do, and how to collect good evidence, and how to move forward to, at the very least, decrease the incidence of wrongful convictions. Um, so, Legal scholars actually have paid attention to the topic for almost 100 years. So there's uh, Borchardt in 1932. As early as 1932 have legal scholars written about wrongful convictions. So this isn't really a brand new topic, although it may feel like one, um, because it really didn't gain a lot of public attention until the DNA exoneration cases. Um, so it wasn't until the late 1980s, 1990s, where science uh, DNA science um, was able to confirm what legal scholars had reported for almost a decade and what uh, legal psychologists had researched for almost 20 to 30 years by that time, which is that um, people uh, may be, are wrongfully convicted of crimes they didn't commit and that eyewitnesses can be mistaken and that suspects can falsely confess to things that they didn't do. Um, so, um, to be fair, legal psychologists really, although they had started researching this in the late 60s, early 70s, really hadn't done, really had done a crappy job conveying their findings to public policy, to lawmakers, to the criminal justice system. It was the, the ivory tower at, it, at its best. So when these DNA exoneration cases came about, and one of the first high-profile cases was the, was the Central Park jogger case. I know many of you are familiar with that. Um, researchers were like, well, we knew this. We've been telling this for 20, 30 years. Said, yeah, 
people can wrongfully confess, and we have an understanding um, of um, what factors contribute to that. Um, and so the first real opportunity um, for legal psychologists to contribute and for uh, an interchange or an exchange of ideas or um, research um, was uh, in 1999 when Janet Reno, um, the Attorney General, put together what um, is, is still called the Technical Working Group on Eyewitness Identification. So she actually had the vision to get researchers, prosecutors, criminal defense attorneys, chiefs of police, uh, policymakers together and develop a set of guidelines that are evidence-based um, to collect eyewitness evidence. So she focused mostly on eyewitness evidence and I'll talk, I'll talk mostly about eyewitness evidence today because that is where most of the knowledge is, but there are other newer areas um, that also have been shown to contribute to wrongful conviction cases that um, I will also touch upon um, today. Um, the, there's really two great sources um, to get an overview over the uh, prevalence of wrongful convictions, and that is the Innocence Project uh, website um, and the National Registry of Exonerations. I had a hyperlink here, but we're gonna cut it short. Um, so the National Registry of Exonerations is a more extensive database because it, inc it includes all cases, all exonerations, regardless of whether they were DNA exonerations um, or not. So this slide, uh, a version of this slide you have seen earlier, I know that you presented a slide um, like that. This is, the, uh, this is a, these are the main five contributing factors to wrongful um, convictions or exonerations. Um, some people have argued it's the same thing, some people say it's not the same thing, but let's not get lost in the details of that. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see the percentage of exonerations, um, and um, here are the, if you, if you analyze these cases of wrongful convictions um, and go through the case files and try to find out what went wrong, then these are the main factors of what went wrong across all of these cases. So mistaken witness identification, um, which, I will, I will expand upon that because it's, it's a kind of a simplified way of looking at things because this is, it's not just about incorrectly identifying somebody. It's also about how this witness was interviewed, how often the witness was interviewed, how often the witness was presented with a show up, with the lineup, with the photo, whether there was an, a courtroom ID, whether the witness has been exposed to the suspect's picture between interviews, between the lineups. So it is... Um, it is witness memory is a complex um, um, kind of drawer of evidence, and I'll try to dissect that a little bit for you with the help of science. Um, perjury, false accusations. Um, you know, it's, again, as a researcher, it's not a clear-cut category. What may look as a false accusation sometimes is what we call a false memory. So people come to believe things that are incorrect and they actually develop a highly vivid memory um, of an event or of a phase and then they truly believe, if you talk a lot, a lot if you talk to witnesses in uh, wrongful conviction cases, they were flabbergasted when DNA evidence proved those people to be innocent later because they're like, I'm 100%, I have a vivid memory of this perpetrator, sometimes assaulting me. So very personal crimes where you would think this person got a good look. False confessions, we'll talk about that. Um, false confessions are particularly powerful because to this day, um, novices or laypersons, when we research them and ask about their attitudes, still don't really believe that they would ever falsely confess to something they didn't do. Um, so they find it hard to believe that others would because right? they underestimate the power of the situation. For those of you who've taken social psychology, Fundamental attribution error would be the right keyword here, but we're not going to go into detail uh, of that. Um, false or mis misleading forensic evidence. Um, I have some slides at the end. I think I'll skip that because we have the expert right here who will talk after me. 
Um, but it's, this has gained a lot of recent attention. Um, but it's really important when we talk about uh, errors. I will say that when we talk about errors in forensic evidence, it's really important to distinguish between whether there was an error that was made in the lab or whether perfectly fine and accurate forensic evidence was misrepresented in a court of law by defense attorneys, by prosecutors, um, or just wrongly understood by jurors, because sometimes this is very complex evidence. It's difficult for jurors, for a lay person to follow. So we can't, we have to try to avoid the wastebasket category of forensic error to automatically be associated with the lab made a mistake. Okay. Um, official misconduct, I'll briefly mention this. This is really more of a legal research issue and I'm a legal psychology researcher. Um, official misconduct can be something that we call prosecutorial tunnel vision, bad lawyering, slash ineffective assistance of counsel. So this is kind of the same slide by the Innocence Project, but you can see that if you just look at the DNA exoneration cases, you can see that the number one contributing factor is actually eyewitness and misidentification. Um, in, and then you find the same, uh, find overlap of the same causes, just in, this, in a different order, okay? So, um, as I mentioned, uh, before the, even before the onset of DNA anal uh, analyses in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, legal psychologists had begun researching many of these factors that are associated with wrongful convictions. And these lines of research had initially received very little attention. Um, and now they play a crucial role uh, in assisting the legal criminal justice system to A, decrease uh, wrongful convictions, and now also help allocate investigative resources in the most beneficial way. And I cite the NIJ uh, 1999 paper, which, is, uh, which are the uh, um, guidelines on collecting eyewitness identification that were published by the NIJ in 1999. In 2003, um, they developed a training guide um, and, and each police department in the country was provided with a copy of these guidelines. So as early as, as 2000, really, um, there was an opportunity for law enforcement to be familiarized with these guidelines, which is not to be mistaken for they were forced to use these guidelines or there wasn't, there wasn't a mandate, there wasn't, this wasn't a legal requirement, but certainly the information was out there. Um, so let's talk about the number one eyewitness, uh, the number one contributing factor to wrongful, to DNA exoneration cases, which are which is eyewitness memory. So um, we generally, as eyewitness memory researchers, we distinguish between estimator variables and system variables. So estimator variables are variables that can affect witness memory, but the criminal justice system has no control over them. So for example, was it light out? How far away was the person? Uh, was it a cross-race identification? Okay. We know that these, and I'll talk about that in detail, we know that these um, variables can all affect witness memory or the accuracy of witness memory, but to be fair, an there's nothing an investigator can do about that when they encounter a witness, right? But that doesn't mean they don't matter, it just means that we need to keep in mind that these factors are already kind of weakened. If they are present, they can weaken um, um, a witness's memory for an event or for a face. Uh, system variables, and this is really what we focus on most, and, and um, rightly so, because they are under the uh, control of the criminal justice systems, are things that an investigator can do or the criminal justice system can implement to decrease eyewitness memory errors. Okay? So for example, um, waiting uh, for a long time before you interview the witness, um, the construction of lineups, I'll talk about that in a second. So this is a really uh, important conceptual distinction um, between eyewitness memory, uh, between estimated variables and system variables. So let's talk about estimated variables first. Um, one of the main estimated variables that comes up in a lot of cases, um, whether these are DNA exoneration cases or just regular cases uh, of guilty um, suspects, um, are viewing conditions. So how long 
did you really get a chance to take a look at this person, right? So, um, and people overestimate, so research, for example, suggests that people overestimate how long they were exposed to a face. So they overestimated how long they were at that 7-Eleven when they saw the armed robbery. Um, and distance. Uh, we know there's a, that the accuracy of witness identification is a direct function of how far the perpetrator was. This is, kind of, this is actually is common sense. Um, there are a few things that aren't quite common sense or that may go against common sense. So the further away a suspect is, the less accurate your memory will be for details of his or her face. Lighting conditions are important. Was it uh, dark out? Were you under a street light? Uh, was it at a club? Uh, all those things can affect eyewitness memory. Uh, disguise. You know, it's, um, it's kind of surprising that you would have to mention that. People, people have been convicted um, despite the fact that half of their face was covered at the time of the armed robbery. Right? And so um, the assumption was that people can identify somebody just by their eyes, but research suggests otherwise, that actually faces are um, processed holistically. That means we need the whole face to actually create a memory of the face. So it is close to impossible to actually recognize somebody um, just based on partial features of that face. And unless you have a really distinct mole the size, you know, like of the shape of the Dominican Republic on your cheek, right? And they're like, well, that's him, right? If you just, you know, that's a different, we're not talking about distinctive, uh, you know, marks, we're talking about parts of your face. Delay, crucial, important. I've consulted on legal cases and it is never a good idea to wait a couple of months before you interview a witness, unless you have a good reason, investigatory. If you don't really have a good reason, if you know who the witness is, you should interview that witness as soon as possible because the accuracy, especially the quantity of information, but also under many circumstances, the quality of the witness information that you get will decrease with time. I think you mentioned um, about your memory for a certain day that was years ago. Research is very clear on that. People are highly inaccurate about uh, days that were uneventful, things that happened on days that were completely uneventful that are more than a few weeks, uh, that have passed for more than a few weeks. Right? That's also a big problem in alibi witnesses. So alibis um, are a new research field in legal psychology. And the question is how good are people actually at remembering what they did? So if somebody came to you and said, um, so you're implicated here. Okay, where were you February 3rd? And you're not allowed to look at your Google calendar from 8 to 10 p.m. How many of you would remember where they were? We have a special person. What, the, you remember where you were? Was it your birthday? Okay, how do you know you remember? Okay. Yeah, well, you always, that's actually a very good point. I'm always home. So, the, the, other, the other news about, I'm skipping a little bit because I'm probably not going to get to alibis, um, but most people spend their time doing very boring things, right? On Facebook, right? <laughs> if your Facebook feed is any, anything like my feed, it's very uh, boring. Um, so we're watching TV, we're hanging with family, but those are also the weakest alibis, right? Oh, great, you got your mother covering for you. Mm, yeah, right. So. Um, Alibis are, to some extent, memory issues because we're not very good at remembering mundane things, okay? um, but they also have a credibility aspect to them. So what makes an alibi believable? And usually it's the most unusual alibi that's highly believable, but most people don't have a lot of unusual things that they do. Okay? Um, Another estimated variable is same race effect. We heard several people talk about this. So this basically means that people are, we call it, well, the same race effect. It's also called the cross race effect and it's basically the opposite of um, the same race effect, which means um, we are better at identifying people of our own race than people of, our, of another race. Okay. And this is an effect that has been demonstrated as early as the 1960s, uh, late 1960s to be, uh, fair by, by uh, Dr. Malpass and his colleagues. And they found, and this is a very robust effect. 
So we already know that somebody identifying, uh, an eyewitness identifying somebody from another uh, race, um, you know, is something that we need to keep an eye on because we know that people are, uh, on average, worse at identifying people, uh, at, at identifying uh, people from another race. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to go into why, so that's the research behind it. So why is it? Is it a contact hypothesis because you don't have contact with these people, so you don't really, you know. Uh, but that's a, it's, it's going too far for this talk. Level of stress or trauma. Okay. Um, and this is something that's very counterintuitive because we novice people, novices and, um, and laypersons think that, well, this was a highly traumatic event for her. So clearly she must remember what that perpetrator looks like. Right? So we have this intuitive notion that the more stressful, the more traumatic the event is, the better our memory must be for that event. And research shows the opposite. Research actually shows that, especially at high stress levels, there is a negative relationship between stress and witness accuracy. So the more stressful you perceive an event to be, the less accurate um, you are and the less detailed you are, both in your memory for the event and in your memory for a face. There's a famous Morgan study that if anybody wants to reference, a really cool study looking at that. Um, and things that are more recent, um, that have been recently um, started to be investigated, are vulnerabilities. So what makes people particularly vulnerable to eyewitness errors? Again, this, we're still on the estimator variables. We're still talking about variables that are not under the control of the criminal justice system, right? These are variables that, um, are, that present themselves when an investigator hits the scene. H, we know that, for example, children can be accurate in identifying a perpetrator, but they are um, vulnerable to target absent lineups, for example. So target absent lineups are lineups where the perpetrator is not present. Okay? So children have been shown to, um, uh, to be slightly more likely to pick somebody from a target absent lineup than adults. Okay? And intoxication level, this is actually something we're doing in our lab. We have a bar lab who intoxicates students on campus. How about this for coming to FIU? <laughs> it's a great school. Okay. Um, so we have a bar lab. We got a, a National Science Foundation grant to look at the effects of alcohol in the, intox in the, um, in the interrogation room. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, but also on eyewitness memory. So we're looking at the effect because we, it turns out we did a survey of law enforcement and it turns out that many of the witnesses that they encounter are actually intoxicated at the time of the crime or the time of the interview or both. Right? Um, and so we know very little about, for example, rape victims are oftentimes discredited in court because they were intoxicated. So the question is, is that warranted? To what extent can we discredit an intoxicated witness? Um, and right now we're also looking at the effects of alcohol in the interrogation room. So we know that a significant portion of suspects, and we'll, I'll talk about this, is, we're still talking about eyewitnesses, I'm just jumping for one second, so I'm not forgetting this. Um, but a lot of suspects actually are intoxicated at the time of the interrogation, right? And so we have absolutely no empirical guidance on what does that do to waiving Miranda rights, right? So are you like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah you, you can interview me, I'm fine, right? So is that how intoxication works? Um, and so we're looking at whether intoxication actually makes witnesses and or suspects more vulnerable to outside influence. Um, or, you know, the, of course, the, the ultimate um, vulnerability would be that intoxicated witnesses are more likely to falsely confess. So let's talk about system variables. Um, and those are, you, you heard Carlos Martinez talk about that. Those are the things that are now, part, part of these are now mandatory. They just became mandatory. And I think these are really crucial in decreasing um, um, wrongful convictions, false eyewitness um, identifications. And um, so just to remind you again, system variables are those variables that can influence witness memory, but they are under the control of the criminal justice system. So they are under the control of the investigators. These are things that the investigative team can do actively to decrease the chance of uh, false eyewitness memory, false eyewitness identification. So unbiased lineup instructions. So 
Um, I try to. I try to frame this in a positive way, so more like what to do instead of not to do. But of course, this started as um, testing lineup instructions that researchers thought could be problematic. For example, tell us who the guy is, right? Is that, you know, that kind of implies that the perpetrator is in the lineup, right? And so we now know that um, it is very important what you say before a lineup um, to decrease the pressure of just having to pick somebody, right? So uh, a lot of, um, so witnesses in, in experiments uh, kind of felt a pressure to pick somebody because clearly there must be somebody in there. So oftentimes they picked somebody who looked most like the suspect, but it wasn't really the suspect, right? So unbiased lineup instructions are now um, uh, mandatory in the, in the state of Florida um, and have been recommended since 1999 by the NIJ guidelines, which are, uh, any eyewitness is supposed to be told prior to administering a lineup that the perpetrator may or may not be in the lineup, that they don't have to identify anybody, and that the investigation will continue if they don't identify someone. Because uh, this is addressing the concern that witnesses think, if I don't pick somebody, that's it. So I gotta, I gotta help out the investigator. Um, Lineup, lineup construction is really important, fairness. So let me give you an example. So how these lineups are constructed, meaning what these photos look like, how you choose what we call the fillers. Fillers are those people in the lineup who are known innocent people. So the chief of police son, okay? <laughs> um, detectives, okay? Um, so how do I pick these other people in a six pack? Usually it's a six pack, so six people line up uh, with one suspect. So let me give you an example of a biased lineup. This is a case, an actual case from Texas that uh, we consulted in where we were asked whether this was a biased lineup. The witness description, this was a, uh, an armed robbery. The witness described the suspect as being in his late teens, 15 to 16 years old, no more than 18 years old. African American, black male, small build, uh, about 120 to 140 pounds in weight between 5'2 and 5'5 five five and five five in height, long hair and some kind of braid, single row braids that were coming loose. So, you weren't there. Anybody familiar with this? Were you, did you happen to be at the 7-Eleven where this armed robbery took place? I'm thinking not, this is an older case. You guys probably are all too young for this. Um, so let me show you the lineup. Who do you think the guy was? Who do you think the suspect was? Anybody? Upper left. How do you know? This is an actual lineup. Okay, so we all agree the suspect clearly is the one with the braids, okay? So why is this a biased lineup? Because only one person in the lineup fits the description of the perpetrator. A fair lineup is a lineup where every single picture in the lineup fits the description of the perpetrator so that people who didn't see, who weren't there, who weren't witnesses to the crime, have an equal chance of picking out anybody in that lineup. And that's actually how we test lineup bias. We give this to our 300 student intro to, the, intro to psych class, we say, this is the description, this is the lineup, who do you think the suspect is? And if you have 90% of FIU intro to psych uh, sophomores pick one person, you know you have a biased lineup. Okay. So, um, now I know, for example, the Miami-Dade Police Department has uh, a system, an automated, they have really, uh, they, inc they have increasingly uh, sophisti more sophisticated systems, automated computer systems to pick the suspects. It still doesn't replace an investigator taking a final glance because the final responsibility lies with the investigator taking a look at this lineup and say, actually, everybody fits the general description. The perpetrator There's two ways to make, this is technical research term, there's two ways um, you can create a fair lineup. You can either match to description or match to suspect. So you can either 
do what I just said, which is everybody should match the description of the perpetrator, or at the very least, if you don't have a good description, then everybody else, every filler in the lineup should match the suspect that you have, okay? Um, you also don't want, we have seen biased lineup where the suspect was, wearing the, was the only one wearing a jumpsuit. Okay, so you can bias in many ways, okay? Or he's the only one who has a number underneath, like looks like a booking photo. Um, so, but I think these, these, the good news again is that we see these errors less and less, well, yeah, less and less frequently. Um, 10 years ago, you would see these um, regularly. Um, and we still sometimes consult on cases that are 10 or 20 years old. Um, but the more recent the case is, the less likely you will find these glaring errors in lineup construction, okay? Um, I know that um, the state, the prosecutor talked about it. Um, I think um, Carlos Martinez talked about it also. Uh, what's really important um, is a blind lineup administration. This does not mean this, okay? It just means, or double blind, but it's, you know, it's, it's always blind. Blind just means that um, the witness shouldn't know who you think the suspect is. That's what blind means. So double blind means that in addition to the witness not knowing who you think the suspect is, you shouldn't know who the suspect is when you administer the lineup. That's why it's called double blind. A lot of people think it's a weird term. I agree a little bit. Um, so we know this is about confirmatory bias. This is about uh, unconscious bias. This is about um, reducing in any, th this, is, well, this is not about, nobody's concerned about the investigator saying, hey, why don't you take a second look at number four, okay? That nobody's concerned about that, okay? But unconscious bias is exactly what the word says. These are unconscious, not deliberate processes that we haven't fully understood. We're still investigating how exactly it is that the witness is picking up on the investigator's knowledge without him or her explicitly saying what it is, and that's, you know, that, that will take another 10, 20 years of research to figure out what it is. And actually, if you look at the research, um, investigating blind lineup, lineup instruction, they have a hard time explaining why a blind lineup administrator is better, but, but he or she is, okay? So they can't really figure out through which mechanisms the investigator is conveying his or her expectations. Post-identification feedback is a, good, um, is a good thing to avoid. So uh, when the witness makes an identification, the lineup administrator should say nothing, as opposed to, great, you got the guy, okay? Why is that a problem? Because people are like, well, you already identified, so it doesn't really matter. It matters because it inflates witness confidence. So if you give a witness post-identification feedback, that witness consequently is going to be significantly more confident in the accuracy of their identification. So when in a court of law they're being asked, so who do you think, is, is this the guy who robbed you? And the person says, I am 100% certain this is the guy. So post-identification has been shown in dozens of studies to inflate witness confidence, that's why there should be nothing said after an identification. You can say thank you for your time, thank you for your effort, thank you for coming, but there should be absolutely zero feedback to the witness about the accuracy of the identification. Show-ups versus lineups, you heard about that. Uh, a show-up is basically a one-person lineup. So it's typically used, there is an investigative purpose for it, Researchers don't like it because it's inherently suggestive, but there is a purpose for it. If you have a suspect on the loose, right, if somebody makes a description and says, yeah, he just ran off and he's wearing a blue T-shirt and white sneakers and the police is driving down the street and they find a guy who fits the description, he's wearing a blue shirt and white sneakers, of course they need to talk, at the very least talk to the person, right? Uh, but the problem is, and there have been some, um, there's a really uh, interesting, uh, and educational um, documentary, it's called Murder on a Sunday Morning. Has anybody seen that? It won, I think it won a, an award also. But there's an example of the suggestiveness of this lineup. This is exactly what happened. There was a white, it was a, a case in Jacksonville. Um, a white elderly couple is leaving their hotel room. They are being confronted by a black male who shoots the wife, the wife dies, okay? The police arrives and 
they say, well, it was a black male, kind of young looking, and he went this way. So the police leaves, they pick up the first young black male they see, they put him in the back of the police car, they drive back, the suspect is in the back of the police car, and then they ask the husband who had just lost his wife, we also have a cross-race identification, of course, was short exposure, we have all these high trauma, we have all these estimated variables we just talked about, so the suspect is in the back of the police car. They open the door and say, is this the guy? Well, he sure looked guilty, didn't he? He was in the back of a police car. And so the witness says, yeah, that's him. And I will leave it up to you. This is a great Netflix Saturday night Netflix situation, murder on a Sunday morning. The, the hoops through which the public defenders have to jump to counteract this suggestive show up ID is amazing. And there is a happy ending um, to this case, but it's, it's an incredibly powerful um, documentary. So show-ups are inher inherently suggestive because you can't be blind. The witness already knows who you think the person is because there's only one person, right? So you already know who the suspect is. So if you have the opportunity as an investigator, if you have the choice, always choose, always construct a lineup. Choose a lineup over a show up because it has at least some safeguards against false identifications. Um, there's also the issue of multiple presentations of suspects. So we are concerned, of course, we're not only concerned with one lineup, we're also concerned about sometimes um, the witness is shown a, a show up and then presented with a lineup later and then they're asked to um, uh, come to the police station and they run into the suspect again. So really you have multiple exposures of the witness to that suspect, right? And so research has shown that multiple exposure to an innocent suspect can increase the confidence that this person is actually the suspect and can eventually under certain conditions even replace the memory of the original suspect, especially if they look similar, right? So we're not concerned about whether this is actually the suspect, right? If it's the real, true, guilty suspect, you don't have a problem, right? And a lot of these techniques don't create any problems. It's when it's an innocent person that these techniques, the multiple exposure, um, what seeing him on TV, seeing him at the police station, seeing him in a show up, or multiple exposure to lineups, where you present it with more than one, five minutes. Okay, I really gotta hurry up. Okay. Um, every witness that makes a lineup identification, of course, is also interviewed, usually um, at the scene, um, at the beginning, um, prior, to an, prior to an eyewitness identification procedure. Um, and so we now have a really good understanding of what are some of the te techniques that you should use to gather information from witnesses that are helpful. For example, rapport building. We have done some work in my lab on the effects of rapport building on witness memory. It's weak, but it's probably a good thing, although it's recommended everywhere, and the recommendation isn't really based on a solid empirical foundation for witnesses, but that's a different story. Context reinstatement, asking the witness to um, imagine, think back at the time of the crime, kind of recreating the original context of the crime. Sometimes, if it's possible, taking the witness back to the original crime scene, if it's not traumatic, that is something that increases availability of mnemonic cues and can increase witness um, information. Uh, transfer control, so kind of do the opposite of just the facts, ma'am, okay? Just say, listen, I wasn't there, you're the witness, you're the expert, don't expect me to ask a lot of questions because I don't know what happened, so I need you to tell me in as much detail as possible what happened from the very beginning to the very end. Even if you think it's not important, I want to hear it, okay? Those are kind of the ground rules and, we, um, and research, has, research suggests that that could increase the quality and quantity of witness information. Eye closure, asking witnesses to close their eyes can actually help with concentration. If possible, again, we're not talking, you have to, the, it's up to the investigator to, to um, um, determine whether this is a traumatized wit witness or victim, of course, then you don't want to do it. Um, Open-ended questions, always, 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 always. It is the suggestive questions that create a lot of issues along the way. It is very difficult because a lot of um, investigators, forensic interviews and child abuse cases, they read the case file before they interview the witness. They hear the 911 call, so you already have 
information, but you're not allowed to ask any suggestive questions, so you're constantly having to figure out, right, how can I disregard what I know, right? And so some of our own research suggests that actually investigators or interviewers who know nothing about the case yield the best information from witnesses compared to interviewers who have only accurate information and inaccurate information about the case. And avoid suggestive leading questions. And these are tricky. So to avoid, we're not, so our concern is never the overt, so do you think he was wearing a blue shirt and white sneakers? That's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about kind of inherent, when, when the witness says something that is not consistent with what the investigator, so the investigator will say, really? Okay, you sure? Right? So you're not saying, right? And I understand the investigator, I understand, because they have conflicting information, right? But of course, you're conveying to the witness that you don't think that is the information that is in line with what they should be reporting. There's a little. I told you to reschedule the installation date. That conversation never happened. Maybe you planned to say it, and then the thought morphed into a false memory. I'm sure I emailed you. You might want to pick a defense that's less checkable. All right. <laughs> so I haven't even talked about false memories, but let me tell you this. Yes, it is possible. And I've, I've been asked this question on the, on the witness stand. Yes, research has shown that it is, it is possible under the right conditions to implant entire false memories. Okay. Now, it's not typical, and it takes some effort. So I'm not saying the average witness has an implanted false memory, but it is not impossible. Okay. So, and that is the real problem if witnesses come to believe their false memories or parts of the memories or they morph with stories that actually are true but some details are not true. And um, yeah. Um, some other quick things about eyewitness memory. I have probably like three more minutes, two more minutes, two. Okay. Uh, Co witness information. If you're an investigator, please, please, please try not to interview witnesses together try to tell witnesses not to talk to each other. It is difficult, I know, but at least try. We've seen interviews where, we have seen interviewers whose standard operating procedure was to interview witnesses together. Okay, and then of course their, their stories became more and more <laughs> consistent, okay? Uh, delay, repeated collection of information. I'm gonna skip this real quick. False confessions, let me spend one or two minutes on this. Um, um, DNA exoneration. If, if I would almost say that the most, one of the most important pieces that was conveyed through DNA exoneration cases was that, yes, people do falsely confess to things that they didn't do. So it's the most powerful piece of evidence, right? Because people say, no, people would never do that. And I'm like, well, yes, they do, okay? And you can't argue with DNA exoneration cases where you have a false confession and DNA that doesn't match. Um, one of the big issues that research is very critical of, a lot of police officers use the read technique. Um, I understand um, that it's widely uh, trained. Um, just know that researchers have a whole series of issues with the read technique for a variety of reasons. But I would say as a researcher, my most it makes me most suspicious that the inbow and all are yet to provide a single data set to back up any of their claims. So they say they have an 80 to 90% uh, success rate and research for 20 years have said, please give us the data. We would love to look at generic. Maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we're not testing it the way. And they just uh, can't provide that. And we have now hundreds of studies that have looked at deception detection that show that these techniques have a high likelihood. A, do not accurately detect deception. There are techniques that you can use. They're very difficult. Uh, it's not easy to detect deception. Um, and um, yeah. Um, so some of the problems with the re-technique, neither novices nor experts are good at detecting deception. Just give me the timeout when I'm running out of time. Yeah, I'm done, okay. And so, okay, IP, IP. No, I, I, I thought I was running out of slides and I'm halfway through my presentation. That always happens. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
All right, thank you all for staying. We have a, our last speaker, not last, not least, but amazing. So Colleen Carbine comes from the Miami-Dade Lab. She's a quality assurance manager uh, at the Forensic Science Bureau. She's been with the Bureau for over 18 years. She began her career as a criminalist in the analytical section of controlled substances and later moved into the analytical section of trace evidence. So I'd like to introduce our last speaker. She's a very important speaker and her name is Colleen. Come on up. Okay, I'm not a podium type of girl, so. I'm gonna kind of walk around here. Um, laboratory quality assurance manager. Yeah, it kind of sounds what it, what, you're, what it sounds like is boring. And what I'm gonna tell you is it's probably one of the most important jobs that a laboratory can have. Without quality assurance, without accountability, you can't take that evidence to court. You can't, the prosecutor cannot present that evidence in court and the case can potentially fall, uh, fall apart. So let me talk a little bit about the Bureau. Um, Miami-Dade Police Department has four sections. We have an analytical section, which is controlled substances and trace evidence analysis. We have forensic biology, which um, obviously from today has been one of the most important sections, which is talking about DNA and DNA um, evidence used for post-conviction um, cases. We have the forensic identification section, which is our firearms, tool marks, and the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network unit. Um, that unit actually is a unit that takes um, casings from scenes and puts them into a national database, and we're able to determine crimes that are connected, um, sometimes thousands of cases. And um, then we have the fingerprint identification section. That's our master file unit, our latent print unit, and our APHIS unit. Okay, first thing with the laboratory is our main concern is commitment to quality and commitment to accuracy and precision. Um, how we deal with that very first is our personnel. All of our personnel are scientists. We all have bachelor's degrees in either chemistry or biology. And um, we are all well vetted. We have a background check. And actually, we've had discussions with our human resources, um, our section. They have told us that sometimes they think we are too stringent on what we look for in personnel. But again, if coming into the field if you're not of quality and you don't have the right background then you, when you go to present your stuff in court your your integrity is going to be called into question so um one of the actually one of the main things that um our commander says all the time especially now when i first started we didn't have the social media we didn't have everybody talking on twitter and everything nowadays with social media if you want to go into this field, be very careful what you're posting. If it's something that you would not want a judge to see, then don't post it. They're going to find it, they're going to use it, and they're going to attack your integrity. Um, in order for us to ensure that the evidence and the way that we process evidence is correct, accurate, and up to date, we are an accredited lab. Basically, what that means is that there's an outside body that has standards and um, requirements that we must follow. And by doing that, um, we, we ensure our process that we are doing everything the same way every time and that when somebody comes behind us, if we have a defense expert, They'll come behind us, they'll look at our, our evidence and how we processed it, how we answered the questions. They will get the exact same answer that we do. Um, we've been accredited, voluntarily accredited since 1989. There's been a lot of talk in the community about it becoming a mandatory um, requirement. We are, it's still not. However, we were on the forefront and have always been accredited. In 2015, 
our fingerprint identification section has also become accredited. They were never under the lab before, so the first year that they became under the lab, we had them accredited. Again, it's a high standard. We make sure that everything that we put out follows these requirements. I'm kind of fast tracking here a little bit. For the standards that we have to meet, I know um, Ms. St. John uh, touched on um, CALEA. That's for law enforcement. There's also, in, in the state of Florida, there's also the Florida law, um, law enforcement accreditation. So that's CFA, and we have to abide by that. But in addition, we have to abide by an additional 220 standards in our laboratory to ensure um, processing of evidence. Um, in our lab, we ensure that we meet or exceed the requirements, and nine times out of 10, we are exceeding them, and if you, it, um, during an audit, uh, Ms. St. John talked about an audit of the property room. Um, for us, we have on-site personnel every other year that come, they look at our, everything that we do, how we process evidence, make sure that we're doing it uh, correctly, and every time, if there's anything that ever comment, anything that, not that we did wrong, but we may not, they feel that we maybe didn't meet it. It always comes down to what we write and what we say we do and our standards. We have never had an issue with the national standards. So it's because we are too stringent. Um, I, this is where the evidence comes in. I'll take you through a piece of evidence real quick. Um, our SURF, which is our central evidence reception facility, that's where our evidence is, um, every piece of evidence that comes into the laboratory comes through here. Sharon spent many a day, many an hour here. Um, and this is just one of our personnel. Um, okay, evidence comes into the lab. The first thing our people at SURF ensure is the integrity of the evidence. Does it meet our submission guidelines? Is it sealed, is it, um, ha does it have initials, um, is it in the right packaging? If it's not, if it doesn't meet those requirements, it's not coming into the lab. We are not gonna start off with something that's incorrect and keep going. We will call an officer, we will call the detective, we will call the property room and have them come back and do what they need to do with the evidence. That's not on us, we are, the big thing about the criminalist and the science is I don't care who the prosecutor is, I don't care who the de defense is gonna be, and honestly, at least when I process evidence and to this day, I don't look at a defendant's name, I don't look at a victim's name. That's not my job. My job is not to worry about anything that's going on in the investigation other than to look at that piece of evidence and tell you what it tells me whether that helps the defense or the prosecution, I don't really care. All I wanna make sure is that what I put out is correct and provides the most accurate information. Um, this actually right here is our drug vault. Um, we have so many checks and balances in place in the laboratory. For this drug vault, it's actually a double lock system that is, there is not one person in our bureau that can get into this vault by themselves. You either have to have a card and you have to have somebody c come behind you with a key. So, and this actually is part of the checks and balances for drugs that Ms. St. John talked about. She talked about the Massachusetts um, analyst who they ba basically either falsified or what we call dry lab, um, their testing. And because of that, there were a lot of cases that were recalled, a lot of cases that were lost and overturned. In our lab, this is one of them, nobody can go in here but four people, and the double lock. But then in addition, what we instituted in our lab because of issues like this, and we are proactive, is we have a random reanalysis. And what that is, is every analyst that does cases for drugs, that, that um, analyzes controlled substances, they have a certain amount of cases that are called back every month. 
and another person analyzes those cases. They not only analyze it, they weigh it. They make sure that the weight is consistent with the fact that, okay, you, took a, you had to take 0.2 grams. Okay, when that weight comes back, yeah, I'll take into consideration moisture, so a little bit of drying, but it better not be that I'm missing now a gram. If it then, you'll, then we would go on and there would be a PCB investigation and things like that. So everything that we do in the lab is to try to be proactive to these issues that could possibly affect the integrity of the evidence. Um, each evidence is assigned to whatever section. If you want DNA, uh, then it goes to the biology section and so forth. Um, the other thing is that um, each analyst has their, their own secure location, but each analyst in the very beginning has to go to one sec secured location to grab their evidence. And this is not available to anybody that walks into the labor laboratory. The single most important piece of equipment that we have in the laboratory is our badges. You cannot get anywhere in the laboratory without this badge. In fact, every time you go through a door and you badge in, it tells you time that you went in and who is it. That way, anything goes missing in a property room, in our front surf area where you saw, anything in a section, you can't track down evidence you know exactly who was in there, when, and why they were there. So that's the single most important thing that we have. In fact, um, our detectives that come down and want to talk about their evidence, talk about their case, they are not allowed to walk into our laboratory. They are to be escorted at all times. There are some people that can come into our admin areas, but if you are not part of the laboratory, you cannot go back to that processing area. Every time you go into our DNA section, if you are not part of the Forensic Services Bureau and you have to go in there, that includes our employees that say IT, something's wrong with our computer. You are not going to our biology section unless you have a swab that is taken and you are put into our staff database. If we find a foreign profile, something that just it, it's not making sense. We run every unknown profile through our staff database. Every one of us are in there, anybody that touches evidence. That's one, you're not gonna sit there and spend time on a, a profile that is not gonna do anything for the case one way or the other. And the other thing is, so we don't end up in the national database. If I leave my DNA behind and, and it's not checked against the staff database, I'm gonna end up in <laughs> the national database. I will tell you this has happened. And the reason this has happened is, and, and I'm not even gonna worry about this. The reason that, that um, this has happened and a lot of the problems that have been focused on today are from cases that are years ago. Forensic science has learned from this and we are constantly evolving and our, evi our evidence techniques are becoming more and more sensitive. So we have to think of any possibility that, that could ever arise. Um, years ago, fingerprint analysts didn't think anything of it as far as wearing gloves for DNA. So they would pick up, an, a, say, a television. They would pick up a television and carry it, and okay, I'm not gonna process there because that's where I carried it. Well. Okay, but now you're leaving DNA behind. So now you're, years later, evidence gets called back and they ask us to test it for DNA because now we have the ability. We swab it, we run it through, foreign profile. Well, if you're an older analyst, you may, not, you may not have been in our database at the time. So you end up with, who knows, cases that are all linked and you don't, even though this didn't happen, but you can end up with multiple cases that seem like they're linked when really it was an analyst profile. So we have to think of that. We have to think of um, test firing for um, the Nibin system. What I mean by uh, test firing is um, any gun that is collected within Dade County, whether it's a buyback or whatever, 
It's test fired, which means it's shot. The casing is entered into this system to see about any cases that, that will be linked. Our officer wasn't wearing gun, wasn't wearing gloves. They're only shooting. All they're doing is testing to make sure it works and to take that projectile. Well, if somebody calls back that gun for any, inf any reason and they want DNA, although we all, always preface and say, look, I'll, I'll run it, but if it, depending on how it's packaged, you, you have to you know, realize that there may be a fingerprint or there may be something from one of our people. Well, no gloves, run DNA. Guess what? You're going to get DNA and you're going to get a fingerprint from our person. So now what has been instituted? If you're going to shoot a gun, the first thing you do is gloves get put on. Firearms examiners the same way. All they ever thought about was I'm going to do my work and, and look at the projectiles or to see if this projectile was shot from this gun. They didn't think about wearing gloves all the time. Every time now, I can leave DNA. I can't sneeze. I can't cough. I can't do anything like that. The technology nowadays is just it is so sensitive that the biggest thing right now is touch DNA. People are, you know, the investigators go out, they swab the steering wheel, they swab a, a gear shift. I can guarantee you you're going to come up with three and four people. The technology is that sensitive. Even if you got in the car in the passenger seat and just touched, you're going to leave something behind. And most likely we're going to find something. So everything that we have done in the past years is to ensure that integrity of the evidence and to ensure that we're not imparting anything on the evidence and that it will not be called on our end that it is something that, that we have done to lead to the wrongful convictions. That's not, that, that's not what we're about. We're not on the defense and we're not on the prosecution. You may hear times that, oh, you, you know, they, we've spoken to the state attorney on the case and or we won't turn over documents to the defense. And I tell you right now that the only time documents are not turned over is if the proper law and procedures are not followed. I'm the gatekeeper of all that stuff. And regardless of who you are, if if Sharon was to come in and, and say she wanted a report for a case that one of her coworkers did, she would not get the report. She is not the lead investigator on the case. We It goes that far that we will not turn over any document unless you're intimately involved in the case or have a court order. Nobody gets what, what we have unless it's, it, it's something that is absolutely follows every law. Uh, there's the law. Um, case files. Um, our stuff is so stringent that we can't, if say you write something wrong, I, I write that and I meant then. I can't scratch it out. By accreditation standards, I can't do that. I can only put a line, initial it. I have to initial it to say that I'm the one that did it. I have to date to say when I did it. And um, everything has to be of a permanent nature. If um, I run a sample and I don't know, something happened with, with the is instrument and it, I don't know, something shook and I get a printout that the printer jammed. There you go. Printer jammed and it put a line through one of my analysis. Guess what? That goes into my file. Absolutely every single thing that I do has to be documented and has to be kept in the file. Um, whiteout is a very bad word in our laboratory. Uh, you'll never hear it and all because of that. Um, let's see. After the analyst writes their report, they're required to review the report. And um, at that time, it gets passed on to a technical reviewer. Now, by our standards, we're required to have a technical review. Technical review is that somebody else that is trained in that discipline. And when I say trained, I mean that they go through um, a very extensive training program that we put them through as well as they are competency tested. They are um, every year proficiency tested. Anything that you are considered an expert in, 
you get a double blind test. I do not know the answers. I will be administering it to you from an outside agency to see if what you, if what you say you do day in and day out, if you get the correct results. Um, tech review. We actually have two in certain disciplines. And what we do is firearms. Firearms, if you're making an identification, it's not enough that I say it's an identification. Another analyst will come back behind me, not say anything, you lay out the cases, the casings that are in the case, and they'll look at it and you see what they get. If they, that's, they're technically reviewing your work, the actual work. Our second technical review is of the file. That's to say that myself or a um, prosecution uh, witness, defense witness, whoever gets that case file, if they are an expert, that they will come up with the exact same results that I did. And then we always have our administrative review. Again, we wanna make sure everything's accurate. You may not think this is important, but a transcription and a case number can, can mean a lot. Um, okay, I already talked about some of the security. Um, even certain things that keys, the keys to my locker for my evidence, only myself and my laboratory manager have that. Um, we track every key that is ever assigned to anyone. Um, I talked about the random reanalysis and that, that actually, um, that's been a big issue because even FDLE last year had an analyst that they, they found out that certain pills were being taken and then something that would look similar was added back. So the weight wasn't off, but what was there was wrong. This is our way to ensure that an, our analyst, and don't get me wrong, we, have, we do not believe that our analysts are doing anything improper. But this is our way to show the general public, the courts, everyone else, that we're, we put a safeguard in place to ensure that we're checking everyone. Because again, if you don't want it on Facebook and you don't want a judge to see it. So um, good laboratory practices. Because of everything becoming so sensitive, um, we have certain rules within the laboratory. Gunshot residue. Um, I don't mean gunshot when, when you're shot and whether it's contact or how far away you are. What I mean is primer residue. And for that, we make sure that you have not fired a gun in 24 hours. If you are an officer or you are in our firearms section, you will never be allowed in there. I don't care if you told me that you didn't fire a gun in 48 hours, you will not be allowed in there. You touch a gun, it ends up on, in your, on your holster. Um, firearms, they may not have test fired a gun that day, but they're around the primer residue, so you will not be allowed in there. Um, for DNA, we now have not only gloves and lab coats, but you also have masks. The, also, the other unspoken rule is you will not speak when you are processing evidence. In certain areas, you will not speak. I don't care if you have a mask on or whatever. You will not impart any DNA on that evidence. Fire debris analysis. Nine times out of 10, our cases are gasoline. If you're a fire debris analyst, unspoken rule, you will not pump gas that day. You will not have any, and, and you do this every time to ensure when you go into court, you don't know, you could be asked, did you pump gas today? Or the day that you processed, did you pump gas? No, I did not. And I can confidently say that because that's part of my procedure. And as the quality assurance manager, it's extremely important that I have these procedures in place for my analysts so that when they get on the stand and backed into a corner or somebody doesn't like something that they did, they can turn around and say that I've done everything today, yesterday, and every day according to my standard operating procedures. And this is how I do it every day. It's nationally recognized. We are accredited and have our checks and balances and have an outside agency come in and check our stuff. Every year, we either have to submit a report or we have that agency come in and accredit us. And for DNA, we also have another accrediting body, which has about another 120 standards that we have to also abide by. 
Um, one of the other things is, is we always make sure that we only have one package per case open at, at a time. You walk into our area, if I'm processing this case, if I'm processing item one, two, and three, and two and three are in different packages, they are off to the side or in my locker. I am only working on one piece of evidence at one time. Um, and this is what I talked about earlier. We're constantly reevaluating our procedures. Our procedures are not static. And what you see today, tomorrow morning, I may have to be changed. And we constantly make sure that we're ever evolving. So I kind of fast tracked it, so I may not have gotten everything across. But, um, and this is just an additional one. Moving forward, um, our laboratory is getting away from paper. So not only will we be, be saving tons of trees, we'll be um, actually helping the entire system. Um, our investigators will be able to pre-log their evidence to tell us what's coming over. We can tell them whether it meets the guidelines or not before they even get there. And for keeping all information that we do, since everything is electronic, soon as we write it, soon as it's run on the instrument, it automatically goes into an electronic case file. You can't get rid of anything. There's an audit trail. The attorney the, or the lead detective can log into the system and they will be able to see at each step where their evidence is. So there's a lot of, uh, it's really exciting for us because we don't have to worry about all this paper and um, at, on the QA end, there's a lot more that a lot of things that I don't have to worry about if something gets lost or it's not numbered properly. So, but that's all I have for you today. I know we're trying to rush. Okay, is this for Herman? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, so my question is, after all of that happened to you, what did you do after being released back into society? Was it different? Was it weird for you? How did that like work out for you? Well, since my release, I, I, like I said before, I think it was an act of God that I went through what I went through uh, because now I travel the s state completely, the whole state, uh, speaking about the death penalty, abolishing the death penalty, criminal justice reform, um, working on elections, campaigns. I get to hang out with senators, attorneys, and things like that. So. It turned out to be a positive way, and one thing I did, I learned that um, if you notice, you have a form here with all the, uh, a, a lot of the elements of the criminal justice system here. And as you see, everyone has a job, and sometimes those jobs don't get done correctly because of overloading or somebody don't want to do their job or something like that, and we have uh, problems. but. Since I've been home, I, I, in fact, I actually, uh, in two weeks, I actually get to take a trip to Rome, Italy. You know, I mean, what can you do with traveling free? <laughs> yes. So, you know, that's what I do now. And I feel great about being home and being able to do what I can do. Any more questions? What about for Samantha? Got released straight from death row, and they, they come there, or do they bring you 
when I got released, when I got released uh, from death row, because there was so many news cameras out front, they wouldn't release me to my parents there. They stuck me in a van and drove me back down from uh, from SF, FSP to Martin County. When my mom now met me in the parking lot and we went to Walmart. I didn't want to go get food. I wanted some clothes. I just wanted some jeans and some shoes, <laughs> you know, just some clothes. Any other questions? What do I tell what? No, actually, I slept, I slept on death row until the day they say you were released. When that day they say I was released, I was actually gone. Because what happened with the appeal process is that um, I think like July 14th or something like that. Uh, no, July 9th, uh, 2009, the, the, the Florida Supreme Court made a decision. But because the the state has the right to appeal the decision. Uh, the state, instead of being gracious and saying, okay, we're not gonna appeal it, they made me wait the 14 days all the way out and then uh, release me. Yes. That's God. I, I'm going to tell you something that I learned about religion. It doesn't matter what religion you have. It's like a, uh, it's like a river. If you look at all these different rivers in the world, they lead all right back to one body, one sea. You know, and all those seas connected to one sea. It's one body of water all the way around. So, yes, I believe in God, so. No. No, the murder, in fact, the murder is still is on my record. And when the police pulls me, well, I fought it for a while, and I think it, it might have came off. I'm not sure. But the conviction, the, the conviction was actually still pin, saying guilty at the first five years, and I had to file a motion back to back until they um, made it not guilty. But... When I used to get pulled by the police, they used to they used to hurry up and pull the guns out on me, pulling me out of the car because they was like I was out on condition release for murder. Instead of saying I was exonerated, it was saying I was out for condition release, like I was out on probation for murder. <laughs>